Hey guys, welcome back. We are honored today to have the guest we have today. He yeah. is he has a PhD from Warwick. He was the director of strategy for the deputy deputy prime minister of the UK, society editor at the Observer, an economics correspondent at the UK Guardian, and he is currently a writer and scholar and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. He is the author of a fantastic book called Of Boys and Men. Please welcome Dr. Richard Reeves, how are you doing today, sir? Golf Thank clap. you. <laughs> yes, Thank you for coming. Yeah. Well, no, great to be here. Awesome. We got Rolo Tomasi on here, and uh, yeah. we, we have a, we, a really great discussion. Uh, uh, Dr. Reeves, you have done so many interviews, and I've listened, I listen to pretty much all of them. Hmm. And so I want to get to some. God, like, I, I hope you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, double speed while you're in the gym, man. You can get through anything. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, I, I want to get to some like second level questions. The first one that I have is, you wrote a book based completely on empir empirical data dealing with how, for instance, a, a great example was 13 percentage points women were attending college less than men back in 1975. And today it's mm -hmm. eight, 15 percentage points where women are attending more. About 60% of uh, people enrolled in college are female. In, the, in this case, when you gave this empirical data, which side of the political aisle, because you, you've worked in the media and you've worked in government, which side of the political aisle has been more uh, receptive to what you're doing or not receptive? What would have been the receptions for, mm. for, for you? Well, I think the first thing to say is that just getting getting our facts straight is hugely important. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I consider the work to be fact forward. Right? Let's just establish what are, what are the basic facts, and then we can argue about does it matter? Why is it happening? And it's actually 72, 1972, and the reason why that's an important year is because that's when Title IX was Correct. passed to yeah. promote mm -hmm. gender equality. And it's now a little bit wider. We have a bigger gender gap in higher education today than when Title IX was passed. It's just the other way around. Yes. So, we've seen, so we have Title IX level inequality, but just the other way around. Mm. And what's interesting about that is that people who work in the field know that, right? So everyone who works in education, these, these are not secret facts. Yes. They're published every year. But it's then how do people react to it? What, and what I've discovered is that more conservative people probably were more likely to know that because in some ways they've been talking about some of these issues perhaps mm. for a little bit longer. People on the left perhaps are a little bit less aware of it. And so I've been a bit surprised how surprised some people are um, to know that fact. They sort of knew there was a gap. They didn't know how big it was, honestly. I didn't know how big yeah. the had gone. That's partly why I ended up writing the book. The, mm -hmm. the concept right. of uh, being a former U.S. military aviator, the concept of there being for more as a percentage more female military pilots than there are male kindergarten mm. teachers. Twice, yeah. twice as many. Twice as, as many yeah. as a share. That, that's really interesting. And then the idea, and we talked about this last night when we had the, the five uh, models on here, and asked the, the number of male psychologists under the age of 30 mm. being 5%. Mm -hmm. just, just, and the thing is that has long-term uh, uh, long effects because those become the educators for future psychologists right. and almost entirely, teachers, yeah. almost entirely yeah. uh, female. Yeah. yeah. No, I was just going to say is like uh, as far as uh, the the stats and everything that uh, that you're you know coming out with, I, I, the reason I found you really interesting, I, I by the way, I was the one that suggested you be on Dr. Phil. He's the this is the guy that was across from me. Hmm. Um, the the reason why I wanted to talk to you about this is because I felt like we could have like a substantive conversation, and mm -hmm. so I was like, I, it's not like gotcha media. We couldn't have that, at Dr. Phil. Clearly, right. um, but um, I wanted to sort of continue some of the stuff that we were talking. How they we can even talk to each other behind the scenes, um, right. but uh, I, I really wanted to be able to have that substantive conversation with you, and I, I want to thank you for coming in here and, well, and, thank and doing this with us. Well, thank you. I mean, I think the thing mm -hmm. about psychologists to pick up that mm -hmm. point is that we know that there are these mental health problems. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that, mm -hmm. and we know that men, for various reasons, seem to struggle to get treatment yeah. a bit more than women do. Mm -hmm. But then we make it even harder by essentially having almost no male psychologists. It, and it, I, you know, right. when I wanted therapy, I was really, really happy to be able to find a male therapist. When mm -hmm. one of my kids needed therapy, mm -hmm. we were really happy to find a, a male with him. I get and that so, a lot right. too from the, the guys that I do counseling with. Like the, if there's if right. like if I'm doing want a, a guy. I don't even really call it counseling. I, if I do a consult or an analysis with guys like a one on one with them, if it gets to the point where I'm like, okay, this is like out of my pay grade, right? I will re refer them to like a professional. But it's like it's very hard to refer them to professionals because it's like where do I send this guy? He needs to see, he needs to talk to a guy. He needs yeah. to talk to, to another another man who is like actually trained in this, and it's very difficult to do. It is. It's getting harder and harder to find them. And I think just in the spirit of what you said a minute ago, Rollo, mm -hmm. I think the the point of a any kind of conversation around this issue or anything else is to have quite deep disagreements, yeah. but to do so on the basis of the substance. Mm -hmm. To say, well, here's how I interpret these facts. This is, here's how I see the world, mm -hmm. rather than resorting to ad hominem, right. rather than mm -hmm. just saying, ah, well, you would say that wouldn't exactly. you, you're an X or exactly. a Y, and instead to have this conversation based on substance. So I, I expect we'll agree about some things. I expect yeah. we'll, we'll disagree about other things, but, but let's mm -hmm. disagree about them on the basis For of, sure. of the I, substance. I think, I think what, like, and I was telling you prior to the show, is I think we will agree on the diagnosis 
Um, I think it's interesting right now that there's so many uh, podcasts and there's so many uh, influencers and then people such as yourself who are recognizing that there is a crisis in masculinity at this point, right? I've been talking about this for at least the last 20 years from, the, from my forum days up to where I'm at right now. I'm five books in. Um, I've, been, I've been following this sort of track, the, what we call the red pill, the manosphere track for a very long time. And now it's starting to come into like the mainstream. Unfortunately, that comes with some advantages and it comes with some disadvantages. Hmm. The advantages are we get to talk to you. Okay. Right. Some of the disadvantages is that we have to sort of sort the wheat from the chaff, which is what I was doing on Dr. Phil. I have to, I'm, like I said, when I first got up there, I wasn't going to be an apologist for Andrew Tate. Mm -hmm. right? If he takes the material that I've been writing about for the last 20 years and he decides to turn it into a business for himself, more power to him, but don't come to me and say, you're the reason why he is who he is. I'm like, no, he's, he's bastardizing my work. So that's the disadvantage of, of being, having been in this for a very long time. But the advantage of it is that now even a gentleman such as yourself from Brookings Institute is realizing that, hey, this is really a problem. I'm going to write a book about it, mm. even from even if you're from the different a different side of the political aisle. Right. I also think that one of the problems is that if if people like let's Andrew Tate, who we mm -hmm. discussed on sure. on Dr. Phil, what he does is he picks up just a little bit of evidence. Right. Mm -hmm. from, I mean, you've had David Buss sure. on, people like mm -hmm. that. There was this, I was thinking about specific, the interview he did with Piers Morgan, for example. Yeah. Got, Piers really hammered him on the fact that he'd said somewhere that women's mate value declined mm -hmm. with age or something right. like that. And, mm -hmm. and, and Piers Morgan was saying, you're really saying that a woman who's 35 is worth less? She's less valuable mm -hmm. than a woman? Mm -hmm. How can you possibly say that? And what happened, of course, is that I suspect Tate had kind of half heard mm -hmm. or half read some right. evolutionary psychology sure. uh, about that. Right, and, picked it up right, from me, it actually. Up, yeah, was, yeah. Well, I and, and then he sort I, of, I was trying to make a distinction between like sexual market value and like right. your personal no, no, that's worth. Right. And it's, but right. but he, yeah. so he's sort of, he's, he's stumbled across this term somewhere or other, right? And yeah. then he misuses it, can't defend it. Whereas of course it is, it's res, relatively well known. In fact, Corinne Lowe, who's an economist, I've just mm -hmm. uh, done some work. I've just summarized a paper by her, which looks at uh, a really nice online platform to look at male preference sure. for mm -hmm. female partners. And what's the trade-off between their income and their age? But she shows quite clearly that for men who are worried about having kids, they are quite age sensitive about the partner that they have sure. because mm -hmm. they, they know they the have women's a longer, fertility, fertility longer re change. reproductive career. Yeah, yeah. and so you, you've got Corinne Lowe, this very well-respected economist, writing this stuff. You've got David Buss doing his stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it pops up in this kind of very unhelpful way mm -hmm. from people like Andrew Tate. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, that you see it sort of, I think Jordan Peterson had a similar problem when he used the term enforced monogamy. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, enc it's encouraged monogamy, monogamy it's but it's, it's not enforced. It's a horrible phrase. And yeah. if you yeah. don't know where yes. that came from, yes. yeah. I, then, know. <laughs> right. I was so frustrated when that happened. Yeah. To, I, I know what he's talking about. I know what they're going to do to abuse him. Out yeah, and too. he didn't really back it up properly <laughs> either. And so it's the problem with mm -hmm. this sort of half, you know, having a sort of half sense of what's going on can mm -hmm. be really dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So the, for the people who are wondering, it, you can read it, this in the book Data which was uh, uh, written mm. by the CTO of eHarmony, the idea that women at, get the most right swipes, for lack of a better term, between the ages of 23 and 25, and men some, somewhere between the ages of 38 and 44. This is just, these are just facts. Satoshi Kanazawa actually did a paper on this one time talking about the different uh, ethnicities and genders that received the most and least attention on uh, dating apps, and he was completely and totally canceled for this mm -hmm. because he, he, he made statements about African-American women and uh, Asian men, mm -hmm. and because that happened, that, that nobody wanted to hear these statistics, and, and he, was, he, he had lost, te he's, uh, I, I messaged him the other day, he's a professor of evolutionary psychology, he like, he won't even come in the podcast because he had gotten so much negative press yeah, from, from producing Yeah, because people will jump like all over him. You mentioned Pierce Morgan, right? Now, like, I, what's funny is I know everybody knows the situation with the Tates, they're, they're in a Romanian prison now. Even Pierce Morgan is still on board with the Tates. Like he's still doing material. He's still like talking about Andrew and Tristan right now. Mm. And then, are you familiar with what went on with Don Lemon? Yes, recently? I saw that with Don, Don Lemon. Lemon Don got, Lemon talking about a woman was, not in her prime. Yes, right. Oh, and yes. so, and so, apparently, like people are are saying, oh, he was a follower of Tate or something. Like suddenly, it's like it's this, the religion of the cult of Tate, and Don Lemon's one of the cult members, right? And it's like, no, he's just talking about stuff that he's probably picked up from, from someone. Yeah, and somewhere. if Don Lemon is talking about manosphere topics, it's yeah. like, okay, yeah. we're, we're, Ma we're here. Ma we're Madame, here. Madame Curie discovering radium, that makes her a very valuable person throughout history. A woman who cures cancer, that it makes them very valuable. We're mm -hmm. discussing a w person's internal worth or worth to society versus how attractive they are. And unfortunately, yeah. we're conflating the two terms and it becomes offensive. The idea, a woman's value is her value. That is not, that doesn't have anything to do with whether or not a man, like you 
you said before, choosing someone to have a, a child with. Those are two different things. Sure, mm. sure. Yeah. And, it, and it depends like why you're doing it. And so yeah. actually the reason I mentioned Corinne's work is she yeah. showed mm. that the men who already had kids yeah. and weren't interested in having them or men who didn't know about fertility and yeah. age, they didn't have the same They didn't have the same age preference. And so that's yeah. very mm. interesting because what that tells you is that, that really is just a sense of like guys who know a bit about fertility yeah. mm -hmm. and who want to have kids are thinking about that. And in, in the same way that you might say, let's say a woman has a preference for a guy who you know, has a bit more upper body strength or has higher earnings or yeah. whatever. It's not mm -hmm. to say he's not a better guy. Yeah. He's not, like, he's not higher value, yeah. mm -hmm. right? You wouldn't say that, a, you know, a hedge fund manager is a more valuable person than a nurse right. just because he earns more. Correct. But you might say that in terms of this very specific technical term of mate value in certain mating markets, mm -hmm. that is a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's... It's this inability to sort of just understand, like, mm -hmm. here's what the science is telling us mm -hmm. without that necessarily becoming a moral thing. Right? You're not making right. a moral statement yeah. about value. Yeah. You just, and that's, you just unfortunately, an, we conflate it's an that empirical, right now. It's an empirical yeah. thing. And, of yeah. course, those things change over time. Like, yeah. what makes a mate valuable mm -hmm. is very different in one society and another, and it changes over time. So let's talk about this. This is a, kind of a lightning rod is the pay wage gap. And you mm -hmm. talk – so the, the number that I people hear, talk about all the time is 44 of the Fortune 500 CEOs, somewhere thereabouts, are female. But one tenth, like less than one one thousandth of one percent of Americans are Fortune five hundred CEOs. You said at the highest strata there is a wage gap. As you get go lower down the strata, there's less of a wage gap. Can you talk a little bit more right. about that? Well, there's actually there's a wage gap at every level. Okay. So I think there's two different things going on there. One is the representation point, yeah. which is mm -hmm. and, and there is still this very strong male skew at the top of society, yeah. right? In Congress, in boardrooms, etc. Apex, et cetera, apex right? fallacy. At the apex, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you see. Mm -hmm. And so if you only look around at the apex, you do continue. And there is still a lot more work to do, I think, to improve representation there. But the pay gap does occur all the way down. The thing that's, the thing that's important to understand, I think, about the gender pay gap is that it's largely now a parenting gap. It's largely the result of the different patterns of employment that men and women have Choices, after having, yeah. having, having had children. Mm -hmm. Um, and to some extent, it's the occupations they're in as well. Mm -hmm. And so let's 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 be horribly unfair to both sides. So a conservative would say, I see I see these videos all the time. Mm -hmm. The pay gap, the gender pay gap, is a myth, right? Mm -hmm. No, it isn't. It's math. It's true. It's in the data. What they mean by that is, if you start controlling for certain things like mm -hmm. occupation, like you know, like how much time you've taken out of the labor market, yes. mm -hmm. you can essentially statistically explain the gender pay gap. It's mm -hmm. not discrimination causing yeah. it; something else. It's right. not endemic right. sexism that's right. causing it's it. It's not the patriarchy. Choices. It's not yeah. the patriarchy. Yeah. Well, then it raises the interesting mm -hmm. question, right? Because then the thoughtful, a thoughtful uh, feminist would say, okay, is it really a choice? Are women really choosing to take their time out of the labor market? Mm -hmm. and, and why are they paying such a high price for that choice? So it doesn't take the question away of is the gender pay gap a problem? It merely moves it to a more interesting place, which is mm -hmm. why is it that when women have children, their economic trajectory is massively affected mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. men isn't? And the answer is because of this difference in the gendered patterns of behavior. Mm -hmm. Is that really a choice or is it the result of gender norms? Interesting question. Or, is it, or is it the result of... Ev like evolved biology I mean, women have children men do not have children correct as simple as that correct. like so i mean there's there's going to be a a hereditary biological and i'm not even like psychological just a biological reason for uh yeah the gender pay gap is actually a thing it's just that how do we explain that gender pay gap is it because of the choices that they're making is it because they feel like any feminist is going to say well Women are forced into this. They have they're they're, right. they're left with no yeah. choice, and so therefore that's why they're yeah. that's so that's the endemic sexism that they're saying is. But it's really no. Those are the choices you have a natural proclivity to. Have. You have do you have a maternal instinct? Well, then I guess you're going to have to make a choice whether yeah. you want to have a career, or you want to have children. But then the question becomes is that how is how constrained is the choice, right? So mm -hmm. it's and and what price do you pay for making that choice? Mm -hmm. And the third thing is does that is that a choice you're making for the next twenty years? Right? Mm -hmm. There's a very big difference between the choice you make, say, in the first year and the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so I do think a number of things are happening here. One is that actually you can structure the labor market in a way that really penalizes you for taking time out to care for kids. Mm, you know, I, yeah. took, I took time out to pay care for, care mm -hmm. for kids, but I did that in the UK. And so it's not being made in a vacuum, right, this choice. Mm -hmm. So you could pay a lower price for the choice in the first place. Secondly, even if that's your choice for the first year or two, and I tend to agree that that's probably the result of some natural preferences mm -hmm. um, than it is of socialization, it doesn't mean that that's, that's set your course for the next 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, and, and the reason I think that, by the way, is that you see women with very high levels of education and economic power making those choices, right? Mm -hmm. So... 
you know, uh, Claudia Golden's work on Chicago MBAs mm -hmm. and Harvard MBAs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you think, okay, those are very powerful women with lots of choices. If they are choosing, say, to work part-time when their kids are very little, that's probably a free choice, right? It's really mm -hmm. hard at that point to argue that and it's they something like and, and, you so. and they're able to do so. And what's interesting is they're much more likely to do so if their husband's earning a lot. Exactly. Yeah. And so it gives them the choice to do that. So I think they have to respect that choice without then saying that that determines that's the next 20 years of your life. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, oh, you should be a mum now for the next for the rest of your life. <laughs> and meanwhile, life, right? in 2024 election cycle, we'll start talking about the 77 but, but, cents and the 81 cents. But, but you, you, you also mentioned African-American women mm -hmm. are more likely to get back to work quicker yeah. because they, yeah. they, they, the, the statement that I think one person you had interviewed said something like, um, I wish I had the luxury of staying from home. I have to get back to work. Yeah, and so if we make it quite hard for people to make that choice to be able to stay at home, mm -hmm. uh, and then actually you will see people returning. And it's very interesting. This is not a political point. You'll see people on the left saying that it's a tragedy that mothers are having to go back to work within mm -hmm. four or six weeks of having their birth. You know, yes. Almost no one wants to do that. And so what that would mean is if we did have policies like paid leave, more opportunities for flexible working, et cetera, it wouldn't take away these differences between parents and non-parents, but it would soften the blow. Right now, mm -hmm. you have to pay a very high price for taking time out of the labor market because we haven't, we haven't reformed the labor market. We haven't no. made it easier no. to be a parent mm -hmm. and be an earner at the same time. So I feel like we're stuck a little bit in an old model of work, mm -hmm. which was like a buy one, get one free model. You know, the, the, you buy the guy, yeah. the, the wife will raise the kids. Mm -hmm. And now that most couples, both parents work, mm -hmm. we, we've really got to update this labor market, not yeah. to take mm -hmm. away the, the, the fact that there will be a penalty, mm. quote penalty for working, but just mm. does it have to be such a big one? But, but even yeah. like as a traditional traditional conservatives who might be watching this, they, they in the one hand want people to have more children and, and want there to be more marriage, mm. but you can't have that. And then at the same time, penalize women who are in the workforce and then say, well, you can't you can't do the have a child and then still remain upwardly mobile financially. Right. We make it a very, very hard choice for people yes. and then wonder why they're less likely to be doing it. Exactly. This is a very weird debate right now because mm -hmm. of the declining fertility rate. There's yeah. a lot of social conservatives now who are freaking out about the fertility rate. Um, and the main reason for that is there's less teen pregnancy and teen sex. Yes. Uh, people having less sex in their 20s. People have uh, less sex uh, like overall. overall. That, we'll, we'll talk about yeah, that and here. So yeah. they're now, and so, well, wait, hold on. 10 years ago, those are the things you were worried about. Yes. You're, you wanted people to have less sex. How about, how about <laughs> yeah. kids not getting driver's license and now there's less drunk driving and underage drinking because right. of this whole thing. But now it's like, well, now these kids can't go up and talk to each other. They're learning how to socialize based on social media. Well, that's what you wanted, right? You wanted the kids to stop killing each other. And that's essentially this what happened. what you yeah. want. Okay, yeah. Asked, this was sure. one of the, my favorite points that you talked about was the American Psychological Association talking about the differences between men and women and, and uh, mm -hmm. aggression and, and actually absolutely leaving out hormones in the yes. endocrine system and testosterone specifically. Yes. Men on average have about 17 times as much testosterone as women do. It has th to do with things like assertiveness and uh, aggressiveness and, and uh, upper body strength. Men are about twice as uh, about 100 percent, 90 percent stronger in their upper mm -hmm. body, 50 percent stronger in their lower body. There are s serious dimorphic differences between the genders and the American Psychological Association doesn't seem to recognize any of this. Yeah, mm. I mean that that's, that became a, an infamous report. Well, it's yeah. worse than that. Right. They they uh, they declared traditional masculinity a personality disorder. Yeah. They yeah. got into a real mess. I mean, it was a horrible mess. The report was weak, and the summary was worse. And what was interesting about it, it was quite instructive because they then tried to tweet out a clarification when they got into trouble, and they said, "No, no, no, no the report actually actually says there are good things about traditional masculinity, yeah. like mm. leadership and courage and stuff." which, by the way, it didn't. But then they got attacked from women's groups by saying, are you saying that women can't be brave? Right. Yeah, yeah. So they, they actually en they yeah. ended up losing couldn't everybody. Yeah. But yeah. The, th the, the thing that I ended up focusing on was, so I said, okay, so have, they have this report on boys and men that treats boys and men as blank slates. There's no biology, mm -hmm. as you say, no mention of testosterone, no mention of puberty, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I wonder what the one on women and girls does. So they had a previous report on women and girls that talks about puberty. It talks about fertility. It talks about menopause. It talks about the impact of hormones on your psychology so that women or therapists who are working with girls and women mm -hmm. have that information as they're working with them. But none of that was in the one on men. So they ended up with this position where they treated women and girls like flesh and blood, mm -hmm. right, as having biologies, having bodies that mm -hmm. affect their psychology, but not men. And that's an, 
extraordinary position to end up in, mm -hmm. uh, given that the, the advice was supposed to be to help psychologists deal with men. Well, I, I think one of the interesting things, when I had Dr. David Buss on, he mm. said all psychology is an evolutionary psychology. And a lot of people in psychology don't like that idea because it is so counter to the blank slate ideology, right? right? That uh, a, I, I personally believe it's more than 75% of our proclivities come from evolution. Like again, I don't particularly like snakes, spiders. I don't, people generally, you don't have to teach them to be afraid of heights or mm. to the smell of sulfur to be, you know, disgusting. That those are things revulsion that are, response. Yeah, exactly. Those are yeah. there, yeah. there's a lot of it that are that is uh, that it's already in there. So I think it was it was interesting because when you do speak to a lot of psychologists and some of them who are politically progressive, they want to go away from that. And a blank slate theory actually makes it a lot easier. So when you treat women as biological objects and treat men as sort of like the only blank reason slate. they are more assertive is because of a cultural construct. Yes, it, but no, it can't be because of their biology. No, that then that doesn't make yeah. sense on. They, on yeah, it just it just ended up in in an intellectually untenable position of yeah. saying mm -hmm. like we're going to we're going to treat one sex as entirely we're going to treat masculinity as entirely socialized yes. but femininity is partly biological which is clearly insane mm -hmm. but i think that, i mean david buss is an evolutionary psychologist so of yeah. course he would say it's all yeah. evolutionary right. i think that the real debate here is like every sensible person will say look of course biology plays a role sure. not only in our bodies but in our psychology and preferences right no no one sensible denies that altogether they'll just say but it's not very important what they'll mm. say is society and culture are much, much, much more important. Yeah, right? Over, overwhelmingly, and, and, and so yeah. what? So the real debate here is not mm. is it A or B. It's how much weight do you put on sure. on A or B. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that what frustrates me about this debate is if you force people to either say, look, the reason you know that, that everything we do is explained by our ancestral biology, mm. right? Um, or to say, no, no, it's all entirely socialized, misses the fact that, For sure. that culture mm -hmm. is actually the mediating variable here. So let's say, let's take aggression, for example. Like, is it true that men have more potential for aggression? Uh, yeah, like mm -hmm. duh. Um, and nobody serious doubts that. But the fact that we have like half as much violent crime today in the US as Correct. we did a few decades ago, the fact that Singapore has so mm -hmm. little by comparison to Malaysia, the fact that over the course of human history, we've seen these massive changes in the expression of that aggression. Even in my own life, right? My kids, they, my, my boys have never really been in, my 20, you know, they're all in their 20s, they've never been in a physical fight. Yeah. I'm like, mm -hmm. wait, wait, how is that possible? Given how I grew up. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. And so what that means is that even if it's true, that proclivity, you use that word very mm -hmm. carefully, I like it, proclivity yeah. differs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it will necessarily be expressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where culture comes in. And oh. so that's actually acknowledging yeah. the role of biology doesn't make culture less important. <laughs> it makes it more important. Yes. I tried to I tried <laughs> to make that point with Imran Ahmed when he came at me and said, you know, do you know the number one killer of women in the United States? It's which heart is disease. of course heart disease, but <laughs> you know, he comes at me and say, Well, it's, it's violent, you know, mm. men being men. violent with women, right? And it's like, well, and then the number one killer of men is also men on top of so, that. So ni ninety percent of ninety percent of murders like are, are committed by men, eighty percent of the mm -hmm. victims of those murders are men. Yeah. yeah. Men. So I'm 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 trying to explain. Really, what yeah. I think where the disconnect is uh, in in all of this is prioritizing what is, it's uh, nature and nurture, right? And it, from from my perspective, and I, I believe from Dr. Dave Buss as well, is uh, na nature or excuse me, nurture doesn't happen without nature. Nature is what pr what prompts mm. the nurture. There's like uh, like family and and society and and all that comes from the fact that you're you got to hook up with a girl in the first place. You got your first tribe is your family. And mm -hmm. so, um, so it's downstream, like nurture is downstream from nature, I, th I think. And then, but then there's a lot, of, like you were saying before, there's this social constructionism narrative that says, no, no, you're, you're, you're violent because uh, society made you that way. Or uh, society tells us X, Y, and Z rather than saying, no, we have a natural proclivity for that because we're human beings and the machine hasn't changed in 100,000 years. Right, so the, the, the danger is that then if you, by acknowledging that there are some, some biological roots, mm -hmm. these differences in productivity, that you drift into a form of determinism. Right, right? Then you, uh, the devil made me do it. The biology made me do yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, My and, selfish gene and, made and, me and, do and, it. Yeah, or, or, or that we end up <laughs> yeah. saying that like, because, you're, because you're male, you're gonna be like this. And, and because you're female, you're going to be like this. And first of all, we miss the importance of culture, which hugely affects how we actually express yes. our differences. And secondly, it misses the fact that those distributions, depending on the, the thing we're talking about, they overlap a lot. Yes. Right mm. now, some overlap more than others. And so the danger, the reason people don't like this conversation, and, and, they, and they're right to be worried about it, is because in the wrong hands, and historically, mm. 
the invocation of biological differences has been used for to oppress yeah. women. Mm -hmm. It's been used to say, yes, you are different, mm -hmm. and that's why you should stay at home and be mum. Yes, you are different, and that's why you can't be in politics. That's mm -hmm. You are different, that's why you can't be an engineer, or a fighter pilot, or a journalist, or mm -hmm. whatever you want to choose. In and that, so in it's that been case, weaponized that, against women. Then that becomes equality of outcome as opposed to equality of opportunity. So like if you go and you look at like say uh, Scandinavian countries right now, which are supposed to be the most gender parity countries in the world right now, you still see that men and women tend to opt for traditionally and conventionally uh, gendered roles in society. Women are still looking for a guy who's a high value man who makes a lot of money, want to have babies with him and go on in, in, into perpetuity. Um, so I understand what you're saying, but there's also the opposite side of that, which is uh, do you have do you have the opportunity if you're a woman and you want to be a fighter pilot should you have the opportunity to do that yes if you can merit that position absolutely, absolutely. but it's uh, but it's uh, another thing to say well we need more fighter pilots and we'll lower the standards so that you can be a fighter pilot and because we need to uh, I, I think, I think in the, until we get in, to in, in the case of in the case just speak specifically on this in the case mm -hmm. of infantry you would have to lower the standard in the case mm -hmm. of fighter pilot you would not it actually mm -hmm. be, depending be, on the, being a fighter pilot mm -hmm. actually you, you are better off being a smaller human being to be a fighter pilot. Six mm -hmm. foot eight people do not make good fighter pilots. So, yeah. so, so actually for that case, to be a Navy SEAL, no, it would be very, you would definitely have to lower the standard, especially for things like push-ups. Uh, you would have to lower the standard for women in order to do that, but not for to be a fighter pilot. So that's the reason why I don't think in that specific mm -hmm. issue it's an issue, but it is when you talk about infantry. Well, so, I think I think the one of the reasons hold that thought. Yeah. Well, well, I, I think one of the reasons why we're having this discussion right now is because we're in we're at a point like what, we're twenty two years into the twenty first century right now, and I think that we have more access to data and more access to. Um, to uh, the the research and everything else that we didn't have before. Like mm. I can go and write five books on uh, on intersexual dynamics and I don't have a degree in evolutionary psychology. I, I have a degree in behavioral psychology, but I do not have it in, in uh, that particular field. But what what's happening I think is, is exactly what you're saying is like in the, it, and it, it's by order of degrees. Like you're saying like in the wrong hands, if somebody has this information, they want to sort of promote a narrative by using the, the devil made me do it or the, my, my genes made me do it. Yeah, what, we've been talking about that for like 20 plus years now yeah. in the manosphere. But like for instance, I get this all the time. People will say, well, Rolo promotes this idea of hypergamy and it's like a straight jacket. And, you, and you, like if you get with a woman, she's just gonna wanna get with the next best guy, right? I've never said that. I've wrote essay after essay trying to explain the variables and all the things that go along in that, in, in the mate selection process. But all anybody ever wants to do is come back to that sort of, that determinism. Mm -hmm. And I and I understand what you're saying. I, I, I get it because it happens on both sides. It happens on, yep. on uh, in our sphere and probably outside yeah. of our sphere. So well, because, because well. it's just so much harder to hold two thoughts in your head at once. We mm -hmm. tend to do, people, it's just much easier to hold one thought in your head mm -hmm. at once, right? Uh, and to say that, uh, and to simply to say, oh, it's pretty simple, right? Yeah. Uh, rather than actually recognizing Bi binary versus nuance. Yeah, and it's incredibly complex. And so you made right. the point that, like, of everything else equal, women would prefer men who are earning more. Well, yeah. it turns out actually that men also now prefer women who are earning more. Yeah. Uh, and like, duh. I mean, it makes it's great to having have more money. Is more great. money is good. Money is fun. Um, I think the interest where it becomes an issue is how you look at the patterns as they kind of roll. We we got into this a little bit on Doctor mm -hmm. Phil, but never got, really went into it. I criticised Jordan Peterson for saying that the reason that only five percent of engineers are women is because women are more into people and men are more into things. Mm -hmm. Right? There's this people things distinction in psychology. He, he pulled that from Doctor Pinker too. Right? And it's true. And it's true that on average there is that difference between you know men are a bit mm -hmm. more into things and women are into people. But that's one of those distributions overlaps a lot. Yes. Right. So that's why my sister-in-law is an engineer and my son is an early years educator mm -hmm. because. They overlap a lot. And and I was recently convinced by some evidence that I cite in the book from Rong Su and James Rounds, some psychologists, who said that under conditions of 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 total equality of opportunity to about use thirty percent of about thirty yeah. percent of engineers would be women mm -hmm. and about thirty percent of nurses would be men. And that feels about right to Correct, me, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because what that's not it's not fifty percent. And we're not going to socially engineer society to make sure that everything's fifty percent. And some will be less than that, by the way. So maybe deep sea fishing, for example, yeah. mm -hmm. won't get thirty percent. But that felt right to me. But at the moment, it's fifteen percent, and thirty percent. You've, you've been watching my Instagram, so, haven't you? Thirty percent is a lot more than five percent. So, 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 right? so yes. come from statistics, uh, one uh, plus or minus one sigma, one standard deviation is sixty-eight point two seven percent. So that would be about about seventy percent. So outside of that one standard deviation, so male nurses or female engineers yeah. would be outside that about thirty-two percent. That's that's where that number would come from. That's what it's. That's yeah. yeah and it's going to vary, of course. So that's just one example of an occupational distribution that can be explained mm -hmm. by 
differences in the preferences of men and women. But the danger, again, it's an example. So I, 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 it was the same argument when Margaret Thatcher became prime minister yeah. in 1979 when I was 10. Mm. There were still people saying, well, like, politics isn't really for women. You know, they're not as interested in status. They're not as obsessed mm. with leadership. They're not, they're not into power in the same way. And at the time, only 5% of British MPs were, men, were women, yeah. right, when Thatcher mm. became prime minister. Well, Margaret Thatcher, I think, was a pretty good counterexample to yeah. all those stereotypes. And now... And a, a politically th- conservative one. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. Now, and now, a th- now a third of, uh, of MPs are women. Mm. Uh, the Conservative Party is the only one that's majority male. And so it's like, well, if really, if, if there was something different between men and women that explained that there are different appetites for politics, mm. is 5% really a realistic explanation of that? No. So you get these... So on the one hand, you get people saying... Women, women won't do this because their brains don't work like that. And men mm. won't do that because their brains won't work like that. And, right. and they apply it to the whole population. And then other people who say until everything's 50-50, we're not in an equal society. Yeah, neither, and, neither of those things are true. Yeah. No, anyway. neither of those things are true. And so the truth is somewhere in the middle, yes. somewhere between. Yeah. The, and guess what? It will vary depending on the question you're asking. Correct. So distributions around aggression don't overlap very much. Yeah. Like Carol Hooven's work on testosterone, yeah. for example. Yeah, yeah. Like the, you know, She has this great chart showing the overlap between men and women in levels of testosterone. And it doesn't overlap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So it's a very striking chart. Yeah. And so to the extent that testosterone is driving certain kinds of behavior or pro- mm-hmm. proclivities, to yeah. use your word, yeah. then that's going to differ very significantly. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, and, and hold that thought. Yeah. I, I, I am of the opinion anyways that women organize society differently than men. Men organize societies in hierarchies. Like, you know, the, the, the chief, and all, we do it with our businesses. We do it in the military. It's like the chain of command. It's everything is very, very hierarchical. It's status based. Whereas for women, the mm. way that they organize societies is more community. It's more communitarian. It's more egalitarian. It's more horizontal. And that's why we have. That's why we're talking about like democratic socialism and stuff in the United States right now. It's because we have more women in the political process. And you see, how, I wrote about this in my fourth book. You see how um, how when women get political power, how they use it and how they will will choose to use it differently than guys. Guys use men use power in 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 stages in hierarchies. Whereas women use it more in the round. Mm. They use it more in, in a communitarian way. And again, this goes back mm-hmm. to our hunter-gatherer days sure. where we got the women who are the gatherers who rely on each other. It's the, the nurture part of all of that. And then mm-hmm. the men have to go out and kill the caribou. And then there's guys who are in that uh, status hierarchy. Mm. So when we get women into the American workplace, for example, we put women in there and they're starting to call the shots in the, in the American workplace. Uh, then you see uh, much more uh, community mm-hmm. uh, initiatives, like for instance, like pregnancy leave, which I don't, I don't disagree with, right? I think that's a great idea for, for them to have. But again, the structure of that company was created based on a hierarchy against other guys who created another company yeah. mm-hmm. who are structured on a hierarchy and they're competing against each other to wipe the other guy out because that's the, co- that's the competition uh, idea. Mm. So the way that women organize society and the way that men organize society are like, very different. And again, because of a mm. natural proclivity for those things. Well, of so, course, now you sound like a radical feminist. If I do, I, do I? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, there we yeah. go. There's the TikTok yeah. clip I mean, right there. there. there you go. Radical feminist, Rolo Tomas. That's, that's the argument that you, like, you get the argument that if women ran society, we wouldn't have recessions. Or right. wars, have wars and so on, right. and because mm-hmm. they have this superior in in this in this telling of it, mm-hmm. superior morality, which is more horizontal, more communal, etc. It's mm-hmm. less aggressive, less status organized, less risk taking, mm-hmm. etc. And what's interesting about that is like where you do go with that thought. I came across one study which was dangerous because it immediately conformed with my priors, right? So you have to be very careful about that. But what it found was on average, like men are more risk-taking than women. Yes. Right? That yes. seems to be one of those pretty standard Proclivity. things. Right? Proclivities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, pretty standard. Mm-hmm. And then they applied that to the business setting. What they found was that companies that were run by women, where the women's CEO and COO, tended to be less likely to go bankrupt, but were a little bit less profitable. The ones that were run by men were a bit more profitable, but were more likely to go under, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that was very interesting. Win big or go home. Yeah. yeah. And so that was perfectly consistent <laughs> with this difference what you'd expect. So what do you do with that? What you, 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 uh, it seems to me you don't either say, we want a society that's one or the other. What you do is you say, let's get a bit of balance in there. That seems mm. to be a very good argument for boardroom diversity. Mm. And maybe what's happening is that more women are coming into the economy. The economy is changing in ways that mix, quotes, masculine and feminine virtues mm. and ma- values, which given that we are 50% female and 50% male, is surely a good thing. Mm. We don't want an economy run by men or by women. We want an economy run by both because we all have to live in it, there right? Was a, there was a paper done where you're, you're speaking at UNLV right after this. There was a paper done there where they actually looked at men betting 
uh, gambling mm-hmm. when there were attractive women nearby. They yeah. found two things. Number one, testosterone serum would increase. And number yeah. two, they would bet bigger. Right. They would bet bigger when women were around. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about mm. was the idea of the, di- of the distributions overlapping. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is my favorite city to ever live in. Mm-hmm. Carolyn Goodman is our mayor, and she is a hardline conservative. Like, she wanted us back. She wanted to get the masks off, get us back to work immediately. And you find that some cases, like, where right. there, there are some women, some yes. of the, some women, and the, I found this also being a U.S. military officer, some of the hardest commanders I ever had were women. Right. Because they understood the judgment that was put against them, for, uh, starting off as being woman, a female, so the lieutenant colonels that were my squadron commanders were some of the least funny, most disciplined, hardline people that I'd ever met uh, because of that situation. So you, the, the well, distributions you. overlap. I, I, Margaret Thatcher is a good example exactly. too. And so what that means is the re, the the fact that we acknowledge these differences on average doesn't mean we treat any individual differently, Correct. right? That's mm. that's what uh, economists call statistical discrimination. Yeah. And I got to tell you, that's what that's where. We have to be very careful because if people hear this language, they hear, oh, there are these differences, that can feed into their decision making. And I don't want my sister-in-law to be discriminated against as an engineer just because on average there are going to be fewer women who are engineers. But nor do I want my son to be discriminated against as an early years educator just because on average Mm. there are fewer men interested in that. I don't want them as individuals to be treated any differently even if the overall distributions uh, are different. And that's, a, again, it's a hard thing for some people to get their head around, which is how can I treat you as an individual, right? Mm-hmm. You, I want my son to be able to be an early as, I don't want them, I, and he does face discrimination, yeah. mm-hmm. right? I don't want him to face that discrimination mm-hmm. um, because just because the distributions are different. Uh, let's talk about this. This is one of my favorite discussions. In the early 90s, psychologists were uh, looking, they were investigating, studying violent felons in prison and when they, they saw these violent felons, they would come uh, attack each other. They would disrespect mm-hmm. each other in a slight mm-hmm. way. And then all of a sudden, the shanks come out, and there's like murder, homicide. Uh, they would they would term this uh, toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's where, where the term the came term from. came from. That mm-hmm. it was you, and mm-hmm. that is toxic masculinity. You stepped on my shoe, therefore I'm going to kill you. That is toxic masculinity. <laughs> when you study some of these people, they they had mm-hmm. insane levels of testosterone, and you saw there were some mental disorders included. Somehow academia now gets a hold of that term, and now it means the reason why more men die from COVID is because of toxic masculinity, global warming is because everything. of toxic masculinity, everything. Can you, mm. And you, you spoke about that at length. Can you go into that? Yeah. And actually, there is a different version of it that was used by Robert mm-hmm. Bly back, you know, back in the day in a very different way. But, but you're right that in academia, it had quite a technical term. Yeah. Te- it, and it was this very specific group of very violent incarcerated criminals. And, uh, and it's Carol Harrington, a feminist scholar who I quote, I think she said mm-hmm. that before 2016, it was getting on average like 12 mentions in obscure academic journals. And then suddenly, kaboom, it broke into the mainstream mm. and became this very common term, toxic masculinity, mm. very rarely defined, as she says, just used generally to signal disapproval. Um, and it has been used to explain everything from recessions to wars, to climate change, to mask wearing, to you, you, you just name it's the it. the boogeyman. Yeah. Yeah. And, and because it's not, it's not really defined, mm-hmm. uh, it just means you can use it pretty indiscriminately. Uh, and I've come to believe that it's a very, very unhelpful term. Actually, many feminist scholars believe that now too, because it pushes men away from the discussion. I think just putting those two words, two words next to each other, is a profound error. And also, just because intellectually, when you actually push people and say, "Okay," they'll say, "No, no, no, I don't mean all masculinity is bad. There's non-toxic masculinity." Right now, first we'll of all, it's like first of all, okay, mm-hmm. um, I still don't like this toxic, non-toxic. I actually prefer prefer something like mature and immature. Yes. Or maybe we can get into that. But it's like, okay. So, for, so what's non-toxic masculinity then? And then they'll say, um, "Oh, I can tell you. I right? can tell you exactly what this." What is say, I, I, Whenever we get into talk, I was hoping but, to have this conversation well, they, with you on well, Dr. Phil. Say, well, I'll finish my thought, but say, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll say ahead. courage, mm-hmm. yeah, leadership, something amb- yes, ambiguous, yeah, something, yeah, so, yeah, and yeah. And then, I, and then you say to them, "What are you saying that women aren't?" It's like exactly that? right. That's yeah. the hardest part. Women, is they say, "No, no, no, no. Women, women, women are equally likely to be that." Then what's masculinity? So what? It's like, well, it's like what Matt Walsh is. What is a woman? They can't give you a concrete, definitive answer. The same thing as what's toxic masculinity or what's good. Well, it's bad. They, yeah. Yeah, it's but the bigger problem, I think, is this is just this language around it. Yeah, well, that, like, it and, doesn't that's, help. and that's what I was going to say is like, I, I have, I'm on the record saying there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. There is only masculinity, and there's the aspects of it that are useful to a female imperative, and then the aspects of it that are inconvenient. So, 
the 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 guys doing the you know stupid stunts on jackass that masculinity is the same masculinity that prompts the firemen to run into the burning building and save the baby the ri- so it's how, risk taking it's, it's a risk taking yes it's back to this how idea. is it how what is yes. the context that it is exactly, used exactly. in and so whatever is convenient right. to a female yes. imperative that's non-toxic that, now, that can be say, an when, when the floodwaters rise yeah. and you right. need men to save you from the floodwaters yeah. that's non-toxic it can be an masculinity. unhelpful expression yeah. of it or yeah. or a positive yeah. one and so that like, Let's take risk taking again, because this is all more men on average more more, more risk taking than women. Yes. G- good or bad? Answer: Yes. It yeah, depends. Both. Yeah. It depends What's the context? entirely. When you want someone to run into a burning building to save a stranger, uh, mm-hmm. good, <laughs> or mm-hmm. or maybe explore or something like good. Right. When it leads them to do something dangerous to themselves or to others, bad. Goldman and Sachs. So what yeah. we do is we we, the, we pro social, anti social. So we have mm-hmm. to learn whoever we are. To say, okay, here are these proclivities. When and how should I express them? When is it going mm. to be helpful to express them? When mm. is it going to be pro-social to express them? And mm. the thing that a culture does is help us learn that. But it doesn't teach itself. It doesn't happen it's automatically. Downstream. It yeah. has to mm-hmm. be learned. And I had this quote from Margaret Mead, which I've used a lot because I just, I, I've, I've used it so much that I've, I've got it basically to memory. Margaret Mead, the anthropologist said, every known human society has rested on the learned nurturing behavior of men. This behavior being learned is quite fragile and can disappear quite quickly under circumstances that no longer teach it effectively. Mm. And the reason I think I've got that committed is because every single word that feels true to me is that this idea of learned nurturing behavior, and she, she means nurturing in a broader sense, by the way, like caring for the community, caring for yeah. the tribe. But like men mm. can nurture, but it's more learned for men, right? Mm. So we have to right. teach it. And if we don't teach it effectively, it will collapse. And so it seems to me crazy to say that we don't still have to think about how do you go from being a boy to a man or a girl to a woman? That's a cultural task yeah. that we're all engaged see, in. It doesn't do it by itself. That learning process right now, I think, is at the root of why we're, the conversation we're having, the larger conversation we're having, at least in the manosphere and really in popular culture now, is like, why are guys such pussies? Why are guys manginas right now? Why are, why can't we find guys who like will will man up and take responsibility? Yeah, but use that la- why do you use that language? Though? Well, the reason I'm using that because language, I'm using that language because that's the language they use. That's the language okay. of women on this show. Use. That's the language. But you're that using, using it now, well. and I think as mm-hmm. soon as you use a term mm-hmm. like that, it immediately makes people well, like react. Because I'm the, because so to okay, that. so let's just say they become more feminized. They become more. Uh, uh, I was just reading but, that we were reading that article last night on on Access Vegas. And we're talking about how, what was it, uh, 63% of men are not in relationships and like 37% of women are yeah, in relationships. Just come out. And th- yeah. so their solution, the, the researcher's yeah. solution to this is that men need to become more female and more feminine to uh, appease and to be a better partner for women. And then therefore they will, then they'll solve their problems. I'm like, no, that's actually what's been causing the problems up to this point well, yeah. because, it's... because they're pussies. I mean, I, again, their words, not mine, but the, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that we're saying that men today are just not men anymore and that's why we're having this conversation on on god knows how many different podcasts well i think the so this is the this is maybe where we're going to get into an interesting area Mm -hmm. of disagreement so Mm -hmm. i i think where we agree is the future is not and should not be androgyny yes yeah but i I agree but i think but we do want equality yeah right not Mm -hmm. equalism which is i think what you call Mm -hmm. it but but equality without androgyny so recognizing these differences but still having equality that's a trick isn't it and i so i Mm -hmm. think for example and i cite the cite this in the book the fact that 40 percent of women now earn more than the average man Mm -hmm. which is up from 13 percent is a great thing Mm -hmm. i think that the securing of economic independence to a very large degree Mm -hmm. by women in the last few decades is the greatest economic liberation in global history and a wonderful thing. It has all kinds of second round consequences yeah, for go. how that, we can exactly, that's that. exactly right. Right. Yeah, there's right? downstream consequences now, so, of that. So, and people warned <laughs> yeah. about that, yeah. right? Yeah. They were saying, mm. but, but so, so like uh, you don't have such a massive social and economic change without consequences. Of and in particular, mm. in this case, asking a very real question about what about the guys? What does this mean for men? But would you agree that the fact that women are now economically powerful and have secured a high degree of economic influence, that's a good thing? I think as far as society is concerned, as far as like the economy is concerned, I would say yes and no. Uh, again, I'm going to focus on the idea that there's downstream effects as a result of that. I'm not saying we put, you know, send women back to the 1950s or whatever again. Like what I'm saying is, because I'm on the record of saying like people want to say, 
Should we take away women's right to vote? Should we, uh, should we put women back in, you know, I'm like, first of all, that's untenable. That's never going to happen. So don't, I don't even want to I wouldn't have that lead com- with that. If I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even have that. <laughs> I would not even have that conversation because you're not, you're simply not going to, you're simply not going to do that. But women are the largest voting block, at least in the United States. I know women decide elections. And so what happens is you see, you see, uh, political parties, uh, uh, stoking that emotional insecurities on women so that they can get a vote. That's, that's you know, neither here nor there. But as far as the e- economics is concerned, what I get into, and I've, I've done this with Robert Kiyosaki, I was hoping to do this with uh, Dr. Phil, but when, when I am talking to women and they say, Rolo, I can't find a guy. I am 36 years old. I did everything I was ever told to do. I got my career on point. Right. I got my money on point. I've got everything else. And these guys just aren't living up to my expectations. They're not making, uh, they're not making as much or more than I am. They're not, they're not, uh, eligible bachelors. They they're haven't not, got, they haven't got their acts. Right. Yeah. So, and so, so, so then they say, well, what's the solution to this? I said, well, guys who are in your particular cohort don't want to have anything to do with a woman who's a professional woman who's 36 years old, whatever it is, has her own things together because you don't need a man. And I try to explain this, like, this is the superfluous thing that I conversation I had with, 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 uh, Dr. Phil, they don't need a man. They want a man because they don't need that man for like independent need, women are right. independent of what of men and their support. So they, they make, don't need they make three hundred grand a year yeah. and they have that's a part of that but downstream I, effect. So that I read, we're so I read the evidence on this. A couple of things differently here. One mm-hmm. is you mentioned this point about the politics here and mm-hmm. the emotional insecurities of women. I think mm-hmm. is the phrase you used. I think right now that it's the emotional insecurities of men that are being exploited by politicians on the right. How so? Uh, by pointing to the fact that men are struggling. Mm-hmm. Uh, Josh, Senator Josh Hawley, who has his Everyone. own book coming out. But we're, we're saying that from both say, sides of the They'll power, say, oh, you're losing power, or oh, what's happening, mm-hmm. the feminists are coming for you, society's turned anti-men, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And actually, that becomes a very powerful message for mm-hmm. men who are really struggling. But actually, so that sense of like men struggling emotionally, economically, educationally is then weaponized by reactionary conservatives to say, yes, you are struggling and it's their fault, the feminist fault. So mm-hmm. vote for me and I'll bring back the 1950s, basically. So I think actually right now, it's the emotional insecurities of men that mm-hmm. are being politically exploited. But secondly, my read of the evidence about what, what both men and women want in each other is just very different to yours. When I look at what mm-hmm. they want, there are some differences between them, but they want someone who's got their act together, who's kind of, you know, purposeful in life, etc. Men actually do want women who are similarly educated to them. They do want women who are succeeding. And that's what all the evidence suggests to me. Now, so this idea that the men who are out there, so college educated men, like right, men who are doing well, mm. the idea that they're out there looking for a kind of like, a, 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 just an old-fashioned wife who's going to look after and that's just wrong they're all assortatively mating into they want college educated wives they want equals in their marriages don't they that's oh, what so, I, so, I see so, in the so let's talk about this the, there's two things going on here number one when we talk about a social contract like a magna carta one of the things that happens is we didn't want teenage pregnancy we didn't want so much violence and in, and in doing so while I believe the the lowering of the amount of do I grew up in Texas in the 1990s during a crack, <laughs> during a crack epidemic, wow. the, the level of violence was just un- mm-hmm. untenable. Right though, at one point the murder capital of the U.S. was uh, so, uh, Oak Cliff, Texas. At one point it was Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Like it was horrible. Now what what happened during those times is we wanted less violence, and as a, as a result, now boys don't get into fights in high school like we did. Mm-hmm. I, I look back at that time and I'm like, well, when there's a difficult time coming because I've done difficult things, I can deal with it better. And now my son, who had who will have never been in a fight in his whole life, probably mm. um, he's not going to be able to deal with those things the same way. And as a result, you use the word pussies. I would not use that word. Mm-hmm. But like that's essentially what's what's going on is that we've made this social contract. Another part of the social contract is the idea of where women were not earning as much and now they're earning a lot more. And from a societal standpoint, we, who knows? A, a woman may cure cancer. The, the, the point is, from an economic standpoint, that's good. What his point is, though, that doesn't make us now want to marry her because she's got a master's degree and a Ph.D. And mm-hmm. so we've got this, we, what, what uh, Dr. Buss would call like an evolutionary mismatch, where we're going to have women who make 300000 dollars a year wait until they're their mid-30s to get married and then they're like where are all the good guys because that's the problem that they're that they're well, having that's the survey evidence you quoted earlier yeah. um, mm-hmm. from daniel cox actually yeah. shows that the very high expectations that college educated women have of men much higher expectations yes and that half of them are saying the reason they're single is because they cannot find a man who meets their expectations and yet and, so, and yet 40 percent so, of men are now attending college and like 32 percent of them are graduating so the question mm-hmm. is what happens going forward I, i'm reasonably confident that we're all just going to have to update our views of the world uh, and what we're looking for in a yeah. mate 
because that's just like that's the way the market's going to play out. So yeah. right now we're still figuring that out, but we're all going to have to change the way we think about this. But mm -hmm. I got to tell you, like, so that's the difficulty. I, when you say like, right there. I, I do do like, if you, I would like a woman who's earning three hundred thousand dollars a year and has a master's degree. Thank you very much. And I don't think I'm alone in that. And yeah. it's not just because of the money. It's because an accomplished, professional, intelligent, successful woman who's like killing it at whatever she's choosing to yeah. do. That's incredibly attractive, I think, to a lot of men. And so, and probably to most men, there are very few men out there who don't want their daughters mm -hmm. or their wives or their sisters yeah. to be very successful professionally and economically. They then want them to have the choice to be able to do what they want without those resources. But but I think you're wrong if, if, if the suggestion of what you're saying is that yeah, secretly, the guys out there, you know, they just they just want women to be the way women were before. No, 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 it's, it, not it, it, it's not that. It's but, but, so the, much, but the problem yeah. is, if, if you have a group of men, uh, Bill Maher, uh, he said this on, on one of his shows, is like you have a group, you have these women where 60% of them are going to college, and I believe 68% of them are gra the graduation rate. If you have that issue, now you have a bunch of men without college degrees. Now yep. you have a bunch of women with college degrees, and their dating pool are men without college degrees. Yes. Then what happens, the standard before was, he was this big, strong dude who could provide for me. Now, now it's, it's like, I, now yeah. I have a Glock <laughs> and I can yeah. protect myself. And, and Bill mm -hmm. Marsden, I mean, actually Scott Galloway and others, have, and, and actually some, you know, a lot mm. of people are worrying about this. I, yeah. I'm not as worried about this as they are. I'll tell you okay. why I'm not as worried about this, because I think what's going to happen is that women are going to adjust their expectations of the educational credentials of their husbands. They're going to have to. Um, right. which I agree with the second part, right. but not the first part. Because they're, because, because they're, but they won't do So I think about my own family, right? In my own family, I have yeah. someone, she's a nurse, he's a plumber, yeah. mm -hmm. right? He's much less educated than her. He also makes a very good living. It, 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 are we going to see a world where nurses are going to refuse to marry plumbers just because they didn't get a four-year degree? I, I don't yeah. think so. I, I think we are. But so I, the, I, the, I, pro yeah. the problem is, the problem is when we, we survey, we have you know lots of women on here. There's other shows that have lots of women. It does not seem like to get a woman to go from on a dating app from six feet to 5'11 is like pulling teeth. Like the idea that these, when we ask these women, what do you want as your minimum income for a wage earner? They're saying 170. That's the top 10% of wage earners in the United States. When we ask them about uh, their, their age or their height or their uh, income, they are not asking for less. And as a result, sure. we're saying twice as many single men as women. Who are these women dating? Yeah. Older, successful so men. So there's this thing about, like someone wrote this piece about you'd, like, you'd, you'd wait for Mr. Right. Mm. Now you're waiting for Mr. Right and it used to be like you'd mm. like Mr. Mr. Good Enough, et cetera. Yeah. Well, but, that, but that yeah. height thing, it's just, I think there's a bad stat lurking, like, lurking out there, maybe in the manosphere about this height thing, right? So I looked at this, which is, whatever the percentage is of women who say on these dating apps, like I want a guy who's mm -hmm. whatever, over six yeah. foot or something like that. But it's a bad stat because the denominator is of the women who said they had a height preference. Sure. And only a minority of women have a height preference. That's interesting, yes. So Selection them, bias, yeah. So of the ones who say, I have a preference for height, they tend to say you want a taller guy. Well, duh, they're probably why they've said they have it. But only a minority of women click the thing saying i have a preference for height so you have to be mm -hmm. really careful who about is, these who's stats. making the selection yeah who's making the selections there's mm -hmm. massive selection bias of the women who care about height they're, they're, of the women who care about height yeah they tend to prefer their men taller but well duh but most women say they don't care about the, height. The but we're thing, also you're also basing that 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 to that data on one one statistic which is like a, a a, a Tinder dating, dating profile. Yeah. Whereas sure. you can go and look at the work of like, say, Dr. Rob Henderson or Steve Stewart Williams. When you look yeah. at like the preference for taller men across the I've board, got, then every, you have to take that. Everything else factor. equal. Yeah. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. But everything else do, 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 equal, Should you go right? break your legs to make yourself right. taller? Like, Probably like, not. Like, if, like yeah. if you went to my wife and you said, look, don't keep everything about Richard exactly the same, but make him five foot six, mm -hmm. right? As opposed for six foot two. Would she go for that? No. She'd much rather I was six foot two. Mm -hmm. But... She's had plenty of boyfriends and partners who are mm -hmm. who are shorter, but they've had other things about them, right? That make it so. Sure. So it's one of these things mm -hmm. that I think it, it's one of those facts that can almost be used against women sometimes, right? It's actually one of those things that sometimes it's like almost blaming women for the well, it's, 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 it's blaming, it's blaming women for their no, state. No, it's of the opposite fitting. of saying yeah. blaming blaming men yes. for actually. I'm, having I'm a five foot eight women. and I'm never going to get laid. That actually, essentially, Andrew Tate mm -hmm. did a clip on this yeah. where someone asked him. They they called into some show and and they said, well, I'm short. I'm a short guy. I'm how tall, and mm -hmm. I, and I've said all this stuff. Women will only date kind of taller men. Sure. He said. He said. First of all, that's not true, right? Mm -hmm. He said something similar to what I've just said. Yeah. He, said mm -hmm. he said. Second. Second of all, you can't change that. 
do you, these are the cards you've been dealt yes. make the most of them right. get yourself in shape get yourself a career figure yourself do not use your height as an excuse to cope right yeah. and i actually thought <laughs> solid advice right because he mm. could have gone the other way with that he could have said yeah isn't it unfair how women prefer tall men and richer men and it's like it's the feminists and that then gets into this incel psychology of a victimhood mm. yeah. right mm. it's like it's boo hoo because yeah. all these women out there will only date like rich tall you know well, handsome men and that's just they're, they're not for so, so, so I, for exactly rationale. they're yeah. rationalizing the, the point them. is i agree with you the, the the thing we were saying though is when it came to their standards and we asked them would you ever lower your standards the answer was unequivocally yeah, no no, well, no, no. For, for for let's see see so the, so i agree with you in the <laughs> first part what we've seen before though is that when a woman for instance a preference for height you're right it's some women who have a preference for height yes, we've had women on there but some women i i we had cj sparks a great example right. looks were not important to her the guy need to make a million dollars five million dollars yeah five had, million we, we dollars had, a year we had, had another we had, <laughs> we had another girl on here we had another girl on here she dates mm -hmm. male strippers she makes tons of money as a real estate agent she's only only concerned with height and physical attractiveness so the deviation for what women find attractive is much larger than it was what it is for men and so when we see when we see this kind of stuff when we ask them would you over time when we show them um, the le the number of men making over a hundred thousand dollars that are six feet tall and it ends up being like 0.3 percent of men or some crazy right. number like that would you then change your standards unequivocally they say no. absolutely they will yes. not and they're going to beat the odds and they're going to be the one be to the one. get the guy who's 6'3 mm -hmm. who yeah. makes five hundred thousand right. dollars a year who's handsome so, and they're not going to so sell there's for anything a, there's, a, there's a very useful term in economics that would help us here right which is the difference between preferences and revealed preferences sure which is what people actually do. Yes. Right. Here's what people say. Here's what they actually right. do. Medium and, is the message. And if yeah. you ask people, especially, um, I'm, mm. you know, that was a relatively small sample yes. that you've just quoted and mm. maybe not a random sample of women. Right. So you're going to get different answers. Sure. But then let's look at what people do. And so, like, we know that men on average are a little bit taller than women. We know there's lots of women who are kind of with shorter men and they kind of figure it out. So let's see what people actually do rather than what they say. It's a bit like saying, like, Men sometimes, I think, can convince themselves maybe mm -hmm. that they're going to get like a very beautiful woman, say, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of sense of... That's what they would like, prefer. That's what they would like. Yeah. yeah and that's it, what I've convinced myself of. Yeah. But actually, when it comes to it, right, other factors are going to bear... Yes. Uh, are sure, going they're to mating gonna, opportunists. Yeah, and they're point. just going to fall in yeah. love. Um, so why was... Hope. So let me... Just to, to backtrack just a little bit here, like when we're talking about... Um, men and women coming together and forming families. However, what that looks, we, we, we usually call that marriage right now. Okay. Right. Um, when a couple, uh, statistically speaking, when a couple gets together and the man is making more than the woman and the woman gets a promotion and she makes more money than the man, that is the number one precipitator of divorce in those situations. So the way that I interpret that is that this is a bio, again, biological mismatch. It's, it's the idea that, well, the guy should be making that. I don't, can't understand why I feel this way, but this is just the way that I feel. And so therefore those end up being, those, again, what, 70, 75% of divorces initiated by women on, on uh, you know, statistically speaking, in the United States anyways. Mm. But About two well, again, so, yeah. but the, the reason why, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to harp on, on data too much, but what I see happening there is it's, it's the biological, it's the evolutionary firmware that says this guy should be the provider. This guy should be the protector. This guy should be parentally invested and therefore I'm making more money than he is and so therefore he's dead weight. Now, imagine this. The woman is already established and has a good job, has a good you know, career, went to, went to college, did whatever she's doing, has her own money, whatever else. She has no need for that guy to fulfill that role. That's why you, you got the girl over here who, who made like God knows how much money. And she's only interested in hot guys at a certain, at a certain height, yeah. because that's what she's lacking. She doesn't need the guy right. who makes a lot of money and is, is this, you know, educated and everything else because she's she already can got that she can side afford to be, She can fixed. afford to be choosy. Sure. Exactly. And so yeah. what happens, uh, and this is the, I tried to express this on Dr. Phil is that when women come to me and say, where can I find, like, how come I don't have my man? Where do I find my man? It's like, I'm telling them to dumb themselves down because they've done everything up to this point to be uh, an independent, strong, independent woman of the world. And they get to that point. It's one of the downstream effects we were just talking mm -hmm. about. Like when you put women into a position of uh, political economic power, the consequences of that is the evolutionary, like you, the, the machine doesn't change. So when, when a woman is, what was the girl who was on here who had uh, 
Uh, she was the real estate woman who was making yes. like $6 Savannah, million dollars a, Savannah a year. Savannah Storm is a real estate yeah. agent who has sold several million dollars worth of homes. She, mm -hmm. But she sells them to OnlyFans uh, girls yes. who make a bunch of money. So while she's making five million whatever doing this, she's also having sex on browsers. Dudes lost their mind. The idea that this woman who's a porn star is making so much money in real estate was like mind blowing for them. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I brought her on, on specifically to trigger these guys because yeah. I love the idea. Because one of the things that these guys do is like when a woman does not fit a traditional role of a wife, therefore she should have to pay for it. And I'm like, no guys, that's not the world we live in. Right. W women get, women will sit there. I know uh, one girl, she's one of the biggest porn stars in the world. She, uh, she quits doing porn and a guy buys her a ring the size of his head and has two kids with her. It's like, nobody pays for shit anymore. And that's the, that was the point I was trying to make with that. But like, but it's, it's, a, it's but a, she's got no use for a guy who, who is, you know, it doesn't make as much money. So we're in this, so we're in this yes. world. So you re, you refer. So you have this mismatch yeah. between like the so, biological right. aspects of things and then the social aspects. So you refer to this this evidence that what the, there's a higher risk of divorce mm -hmm. in couples where the wife is earning more than the woman. I don't think it's necessarily mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. she suddenly overtakes him, which is I think how you framed it. Mm -hmm. But I think but there is. I think it's Marion Blanche. I'm trying to remember the exact um, author of the work that shows that. But it's really hard to know how to interpret that. Because it could just well be that if you've got a marriage that isn't working out very well, it's just as much easier to initiate a divorce if you've got the economic resources to do it. I That's mean, an was, interesting point. This was, so why this do was, I need this guy? This was, the, yeah. this was, and in a way, this was the point of this wave of the women's movement. So if you read Steinem and Mead and others, the, the whole point women was have that, become the men that they wanted to marry. But they, the securing of economic mm. independence wasn't just valuable in and of itself, although it is. It was precisely so that women didn't have to have a man. It was to make men a choice rather than a necessity. And that's happened to a significant degree. <laughs> Very yeah. 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 Now, now yeah. then you have downstream consequences, yes. which is okay. Yeah. What about the guys? And what's interesting is if you read the conservatives, and I quote people like George Gilder in my book, mm -hmm. who was like, he was the uh, misogynist of pig of the year, mm -hmm. uh, I think tw two years running and stuff. And other conservatives who said, if, if we don't, if the men become superfluous, to use your words, mm -hmm then history would teach us that we're in for a lot of trouble, a lot of crime, mm. a lot of violence. Uh, it's going to, because actually the, it's what Joe Henrik calls the math problem of surplus men, mm -hmm. right? It's a beautiful phrase in his mm -hmm. book, weird. The math problem of surplus men, and it causes all kinds of violence. And actually there's this really interesting evidence from China that Lena Edlund had, which showed that the result of the one China mm -hmm. policy and differential abortion was you had a surplus of men yes. hitting mm -hmm. certain China, Chinese districts at different times, mm -hmm. more crime. And so this was the concern, but actually crime's gone down. Mm -hmm. We've become less violent as a society. And I think that's because men have retreated. Mm -hmm. I think that rather than we're acting sedated. out, like there's, sedated right yeah, there's now. this kind of, there's this mm -hmm. fear of like a Mad Max style world where yeah. these bands of marauding surplus men would be kind of wreaking havoc. And in fact, the opposite has happened. <laughs> they underestimated because, because how porn, lethargic because, well, because, because the porn strip really clubs are. and video games. Yeah. The, the internet came. Yeah. And so yeah. here's, here's a really provocative thought is that rather than screens being the problem, maybe screens have actually helped to save us from some of what might have been mm -hmm. the worst That'll agree consequences with yeah. of the surplus men. Now I'm not suggesting it's good but it might be better than the alternative. And so the conservatives mm -hmm. who warned about the effect of these surplus superfluous men didn't anticipate the internet. They and, didn't anticipate video gaming. And, and when we see mm -hmm. this same surplus men effect in like say Middle Eastern countries where there is no porn and strip clubs there is more violence. And, and more, there is more violence. We're gonna strap a dynamite to our chest and go into a coffee shop in, in Tel Aviv. Or just more generally, I mean, this is actually Joe, Joe Henrik's work on this is actually terrific, I think, where he shows that like 95% of societies have been poly polygamous, yes. usually polygamous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, polygamous. Uh, yes, for, thank you, for men <laughs> with multiple white and not the other way around, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then marriage comes along you know, more monogamy, testosterone goes down because actually that reduces testosterone. It does. Violence mm -hmm. massively goes down. You mm -hmm. don't have this competition, this kind of ferocious competition that there previously was. And so actually his argument is that monogamy, largely promoted by the Christian church, helped to create a peaceful society because it did take away this kind of competition. Sure, now, certainly. you might end up in the situation now where for a very different reason, you have men who are surplus to requirements, not because of polygamy, but because of women's economic independence. Women can go alone now, but it still leaves a lot of men on the bench. What do they do? Well, they don't maraud around. They go to the basement. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I think that's a kind of different order of social problem than the one that perhaps people worried about. But it's not to say it isn't a problem. And I think that's the, mm -hmm. that's the gap that many men are falling into. Yes. They don't feel needed. Yeah. They don't feel like there's anyone out there relying on them or expecting them to do anything. 
And then you've got these very accessible alternative forms of quotes entertainment that are dopamine addicted and so mm -hmm. on. So I think you've created a bit of a cocktail there for male retreat, male passivity, mm -hmm. what I call the male malaise. So that's how I see the consequences of this playing out. Well, one of the things I was stunned by is you did an interview with Chris Williamson and he asks you unironically, what is the usefulness of men anymore? Mm -hmm. Do you remember this? And I, yeah. I even think yeah. you were taken aback by it because you said I disagreed, but like, uh, I think you took it in stride initially and you were like, yeah, I don't know if I necessarily d agree with that. But there are people who actually, like, listen, let the Chinese invade and you will understand the usefulness of men very quickly. I just don't understand. When I heard him say that, I was like, the really good looking, wealthy <laughs> uh, podcaster from a reality TV show is talking about what is the usefulness of men. I just thought that was really yeah, interesting. Right. And that but is the viewpoint of some people. But it's the right question because yeah. it's mm -hmm. a hard and deep question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what happens to the men? What's the role of men? in a society where women have to a high degree secured economic independence is a genuinely good question. Yes. And one that thoughtful people have been asking So both for things a while. can be true. It is right. good that women have higher economic independence Absolutely. and we have a problem because we right. have a bunch of men that, mm -hmm. that these women don't want. That there's this second round effect, especially yes. when it happens this quickly. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. When you have a change of yeah. this magnitude, this fast. In 20 years. I yeah. mean, yeah, <laughs> few, like a generation, mm -hmm. right? It's unbelievably quick. And so then it's not so, Surprising that our culture is struggling to catch up, our sense of what it means to be a man is struggling to catch up, etc. Mm -hmm. And so he's asking the right question because lots of people are, are addressing that. And, my, mm -hmm. and I, first of all, for, I think I probably retreat to fatherhood first of all because I'm incredibly convinced that dads really matter for their kids' mm -hmm. lives. Yeah. And so whatever's happening in marriage, whatever's happening between men and women, dads still matter. I don't think fathers are surplus to requirements. Mm -hmm. And the danger with the old-fashioned message, which is that dads matter because they're breadwinners, is that in a world where that's much less likely to be true now, mm. you're in danger of benching the dads because we're holding them up to obsolete standards of what it means to be a good dad. Well, I, I, and I, so they, they hear that message and they say, well, they don't need me anymore. I also think the foundation of the question, though, goes back to the idea, well, well men keep bankrupting countries and causing wars and men are bad leaders. And like right. some of these things that are not not actually true they're saying well because they keep screwing up everything else was it um You're better off without Le them. lenny kravitz was like men let's just give it up to yeah. the women we've we've screwed up everything let's yeah, just let let's women give take them over a turn. i yeah. think that's the foundation yeah. of the question i don't I, actually think right but i don't i mean he doesn't think that and i honestly think you will struggle to find many women including almost all feminists who will honestly tell you that the world would be better off without men I think, I think should, they I mean, would that, tell you that the no. world would be better off if men weren't running things. I do think they would say that. I think they, they would tell you that it, the world would be better off if it wasn't only men running right. things. And there, I completely agree with them. I think it, the world is better if it isn't only For men sure. running Absolutely. things. For sure, absolutely. And I, by the way, but I don't want a world that's only run by women. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the point of gender equality. But I think this idea that there is a sort of a group out there... Uh, a, a radical feminist so, who kind of want to wipe out men in let's, some way. Let's get into I, that because I think this, crazy. Is, this is the this is the key. Um, I need to get the super set. Okay, for sure. This Travis, is a, can you get the, the, yeah. the super This up? is going to be like the key, like I, I guess, debate point for a lot of people. And this is your belief about uh, things going from, say, 13% fewer women in college in 1972 and now 15 points higher mm -hmm. today. There are people who believe... One, this is nefarious and conspiratorial. And then there's another group of people that believe this is just sort of like negligent. And you had identity politics where like, I'm worried about getting money for my group and I just forgot about your group. And you believe it's the second, not the first, that this is just a function of, it just happened to, this is a secondary order, but it wasn't conspiratorial no. or nefarious. Can no. you go into that? Because you sure. understand there's a lot of people watching. <laughs> this is YouTube. There's a lot of people watching. That's absolutely what they believe. They call it the matrix. They, call, mm -hmm. they have all these oh, different names yes. for it. So if you could go specifically into your beliefs about that. I think that that's an incredibly dangerous idea that the problems that men and boys are facing are the result of some kind of conspiracy, some kind of feminist conspiracy that the women are out to get the men. And of course, you can always find some extremists of course. online who will say some stuff, or you can go back and read Judith Butler or something. You guys, you guys like, check out right. Kill All Men podcast. Right. Kill yeah. All yeah. Men. Yeah. It's, on, yeah. it's on Apple right yeah. now. You can subscribe. Sure. Yeah. And, and then you can generalize that out if you really want to kind of yeah. believe in that. But but no, what's actually happening? Like, why are men struggling in the labor market? Not because women came along, but because of deindustrialization and sure. free trade. Like, mm. why are men struggling in education? Because the education system System isn't quite as friendly towards male styles of learning mm -hmm. and towards men as it is to girls and women. Girls have a natural advantage in the education system now. That's showing up in, in our results. But it's not because mm -hmm. some, some cabal of feminists got together 100 years ago and said, you know what, if we design the education system this way, then eventually, a century from now, 
We'll be in we'll charge. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in charge. Right. Yes, I, I get it. Completely crazy. But mm. it's also crazy not to look at that gap and yes. say, hold mm. on, hold on. Something is happening in our education system here. We are not actually educating our boys and men as well as we're educating our girls and women for mm. all kinds of reasons we could get into. That's mm. just true. And that truth can be held without it being some kind of conspiracy. Mm. This idea that because something bad is happening in society, it means someone wants that to be happening is almost always wrong and incredibly dangerous to our collective psychology because it just it gets into the blame game. I'm suffering. Whose fault is that? You look around for someone to blame, and that's almost never the case. And we zero sum game everything. Mm. We look, for, we look for a villain. There's almost never a villain. There are just social forces, economic forces that are creating real difficulties for real people. There's, there's another fantastic book. It's called uh, the, uh, Conquering the Sociopath Next Door by Dr. Martha Stout. She wrote the first one called The Sociopath Next Door in 05, and the second one in 2015. When she wrote, or in 2020, when she wrote the book, one of the things she talks about at the end of the book is called corporate sociopathy, and the idea that you take a bunch of empathetic people and put them into a corporate mm. structure and they are incentivized to do things so that they don't lose their job and that the corporation makes more money. And you take the same thing and you can extrapolate it to government. I do things to make sure I get continue to get reelected and make sure that my tribe and my team wins. And in doing so, I have little to no empathy for other tribes. And, in so, and when you look at it, mm. when you examine it as a... You know, corporations are a legal fiction. When you examine mm. the legal fiction as a human being or as an in individual entity, it acts like a sociopath. But the people in... The people... Uh, inside of it, we're not sociopaths. Does that make sense? Right. What yeah. I'm saying? It does. Yeah. And what's mm. in, you've raised the issue of empathy, and yeah. I and I I do think that, and I know like this is rational. We're being empirical, yeah. etc. But but I think that one of the reasons why people, uh, why men and boys in particular, are attracted to you know a number of male figures is because they feel like they're empathizing with them. They're just understanding that they're struggling. Yeah. Right? Mm. And, I, and I think understanding that is one of the reasons why a lot of boys and men are drawn to the kind of, the, you've called it the manosphere, et cetera. Yeah. And mm. even to, to people like Jordan Peterson and so on, it's just because I think, mm. oh, thank goodness, he's listening to me. I actually did a big think video that's had a lot of views and I've had so many emails from young men just saying, I was in tears by the end of this video. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for understanding so me. You, that, all I did was put up a bunch of yeah. charts. Can I, let, me, let me put a, a pin here. I, I got to get to Super Chats. Right? Yeah, do it real quick. Uh, just 20 and up is, is fine, Travis. Uh, yeah, sure. From uh, Louis or Lewis, uh, 1999 Super Chat. Amazing conversation, he says. Oh, Good job, well, guys. Thank you. ML with a 20-pound Super Chat. In the case of male aggressivity, uh, in my own story, my father was the one who coached me to control my violence, not the rest of society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, Pat I was going to say like uh, men are uh, fathers in particular I mean, are helps. a buffer it, again. It, it yeah. helps How do we guy. teach men? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Trev. Uh, Pat uh, Pat Stedman's polished passport, with twenty dollars super chat. Mr. Reeves, that informal language is how a broad range of people from blue collar to informal white collar communicate. Corporate media and academia is more concerned with the specific words than average Joes. Is that it? Uh, by the way, shout out to the thousand people that are watching us in the super chat yeah. right now. That's that's pretty awesome that we're doing that. Um, uh, one other thing I want to talk about, I really love. Do we got this. any more? Is there? Oh, uh, we got more. Okay, okay right, keep right. going. Keep Just, going. Yeah, finish the rest. Uh, of this. Another one from Pat Stedman's polished passport, twenty dollars super chat, pointing out that most people benefiting from student loan cancellation, uh, cancel it, yeah. cancellation are women and that they choose industries that don't pay enough. Yeah. Is that men being exploited for votes? or pointing out an uncomfortable reality. I was going to say, it's like mm. when you were saying, like, mm. you know, how, how conservative politicians want to appeal to that sort of masculine ideal and say, the, the, you know, we'll be the ones to represent you kind of thing. What I was, the point I was making, uh, at least in this last election cycle, is we, it's it, uh, from the Democrat, the more liberal right. side of the, of the political spectrum, uh, the, the fear or the uh, sort of the stoking of emotions for, for women is you're going to lose your right to, to an abortion. Right. You're going to, or we're going to give you um, uh, it was a student debt consolidation, which of course yeah. women hold, hold like two thirds, uh, two of, the thirds of that, yeah. what, $1.7 trillion yeah. dollars in yeah. debt. So mm -hmm. we're going to give you a, basically a, stim, a stimmy check so that you can, right. so that, you know, uh, come uh, election time. Uh, again, so it's it's really kind of done both sides if you think about it. So if you got you got women who are, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in dire it's financial straits as so a result. So therefore, there's a, that. Here's yeah. your here's your blood. So line. what I saw in going into the election was mm -hmm. that the Dems were going to kind of double down on trying to win women's votes, especially mm -hmm. in the suburbs. And so the student debt cancellation was described as a gender justice issue because two thirds of college debt yeah. is and by women. There was no mention, by the way, the fact that the infrastructure bill was going to create two thirds of the jobs are going to go to men, especially working class men. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, of course, you do get uh, Republicans um, who are really kind of 
doubling down on kind of male votes and working class votes, in part by saying the Democrats are obsessed with you know, sex, gender, you know, birthing people or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm fearing is that the polarization we've seen in our politics is now getting quite gendered as well. Mm -hmm. And we don't want a world where we've got a women's party and a men's party. See, that's why, that's why, it's a when, real worry. Whenever we get into an election cycle, that's the first thing out of my mouth is like all politics today are gender politics. It's every, it's like, and it's, both it's, sides it's do, tribalism. Both, both, both sides are playing that yes, gender card absolutely. now in a way. And you are seeing men moving towards the Republicans, including like Hispanic and black men, for example. Yeah, because they think that, that that's where they're going to be. That's where the empathy is. That's where they'll get yeah. hurt. Yeah. And yeah. vice versa. And then women moving to the Dem side. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this. Uh, well, let, let me get the, are there any more? Uh, 20, uh, 20 yes, and up? Yes, there is. Uh, David Jones, $20 super chat for the top 15%. But the real problem is that their expectation effect on average women. I'm in the top 25% of earners and it's looked at looked at as average average women don't want average, average men, men yeah. until they're ready to settle settle mm -hmm. what's an i think there's one is there one more i think they're uh i have to refresh them. okay uh adventuresome brada says uh best discussion i've seen on the subject matter props to rollo for being on point good beautiful um, um there's there something you mentioned before about men not being heard or people not being heard mm -hmm. so let's yeah. talk about barack obama in 2008 he spoke to a group of african americans that felt different disenfranchised mm -hmm. 95 percent of those African Americans voted for him. Donald Trump in 2016, he spoke to coal miners, people who uh, from who had lost their jobs uh, because of industrialization, because of global industrialization. Mm -hmm. Those people voted for him in a large amount because they felt they weren't being spoken to. And we saw on uh, TikTok 12 billion mm -hmm. individual searches of Andrew Tate's name. And at one point in August of last year, him being the most searched human being on the planet. Right because he was speaking to a group of people that were not being heard. I, I have this conversation with feminists often. If you completely differ, disagree with everything Andrew Tate says, that's fine. My point is, why did he grow so big right. so fast? Is it because we're all stupid troglodyte uh, <laughs> misogynists? Or was there a group of men that you don't even, as a feminist, acknowledge they have needs and wants and desires as well? When I t explained to them a third of men under the age of 30 are having no sex, they can't believe this fact. They don't believe it's mm. uh, real. What Can you speak to that, uh, that whole idea? And the last thing I actually... Depths of despair, mm. places where Trump's mm. Trump won. He did much can better you, there. Yeah, can you, yeah. can you go into that whole concept? So, I mean, uh, Donald Trump talked about the forgotten Americans, yeah. right? He talked about the people, and, and he just made, I think, a, he made a bunch of people feel heard, yeah. right, seen. Uh, that turned out to be very politically powerful for him. And of course, that is something that politicians want to do. And to say, look, we see you, we, we, don't, we, we hear you, and, that, and they don't, right? The, the other side don't. Uh, when it comes to figures like Andrew Tate and others, I do think what you're right, that what's much more interesting to me is not what- Why, why do you think they were popular? Why do yeah. you think Andrew Tate yeah. was popular? Well, it's, it's, it's the, de yeah, it's on the demand side, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not what they're supplying that's interesting. It's what, why are people interested in them? And I think the problem is that there are kind of different mixed up reasons why he was popular. And the challenge is to kind of pull those apart a little bit. So number one, mm -hmm. he's transgressive. He was transgressive, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so if you're an adolescent, and especially if you're an adolescent boy, transgression's yes. really exciting. And so the way to transgress now is to transgress against kind of mainstream orthodoxy around issues like- it's punk rock, right? that's yeah. what it, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So fine, so transgression, number one. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was a bit funny in producing it. Secondly, there was some stuff where he was actually giving straightforward adv advice to people, and it wasn't always terrible, as I kind of suggested earlier. Thirdly, there was some straightforward misogyny in there, just pretty pure misogyny, uh, which is just women are lesser than men. They are second class citizens. They should go back to whatever it was. And I'm not saying that was the bulk of what he was putting out, but it mm. was it was definitely there as well. Um, and so if you put all those things together, what you, you have to disaggregate, which is and, 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 and sorry, um, did I say empathy already? Yeah, one of the yeah. So like. Don't assume that everybody that was interested in him was just taking all the misogyny on board and saying, okay, Andrew, yes, I'll become a misogynist as well. Actually, they were discounting that, quite a lot of them, but they were saying, at least he's, at least he sees me, at least he understands what I'm going through, or what, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So he was ticking that box. And I think that the, the difficulty is it's easier for some people to just see everybody who looks at him must be a misogynist. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. But we have to worry about, even if you go to him for other reasons than misogyny, mm -hmm. will it be corrosive in the long term, especially for kind of younger younger men and boys, for that for those things to be packaged together? Well, right? my, and that's the, I think yeah, we, need to un, we need to unbundle the appeal of people I, I was like going to say that I, I think that the reason why a guy like Andrew Tate is uh, popular, and there will be others, by the way, too, sure. um, is because he's the purple cow in the field of brown cows right now. There's so much... Uh, 
there's so much, uh, I, I don't malaise, I guess, to yeah. use one of your words, that when a guy like Andrew Tate comes in, he's he he seems like fresh. He seems like there's something new. He seems like there's like this is this is a the action hero, right? We need a an a Arnold Schwarzenegger or a, or a Sylvester Stallone. We don't yeah. have those a archetypes. Savior. We don't have those archetypes in popular culture anymore. Yeah. So when what so what is popular culture in 2023? It's the internet. So when when yeah. Andrew Tate comes out and he, like he will say he, that's the character he plays. That's one of the one, one of the things he's saying right now, right? Whether it's a character, whether it's not, I know we both know Andrew personally, yeah. but whether it's a character or it's not a character, the appeal of that character is he's Han Solo, he's Captain Kirk, he is the he's that unapologetically masculine guy, conventionally masculine guy that. It, it it's a breath of fresh air they've never heard. That's why well, he's so, that's why he's so uh, it's so transgressive. So yeah, transgressive. I've got to tell you, as yeah. a Star Wars fan, I'm going to ask you to retract the comparison between Han Solo, Solo and okay. Andrew well, Tate. Well, Andrew Tate, a scoundrel, a scoundrel. A How scoundrel. can we say a scoundrel? I mean, he says scoundrel, mm. right? But mm. but Andrew Tate is not Han Solo. What Andrew Tate is doing, I think, is he's taking this sort of adolescent performative kind of masculinity, right? And putting it out there, sometimes quite knowingly, I think it is a it is a performance quite often. And I also think that a lot of the young people are able to kind of see what's performative and what isn't. There's I mean, to, speaking to him personally, it. he's not, I don't think he's the same person offline as he is online. I, I, mean, I assume that, that yeah. there's a kind of, but the other thing of course he's done is he's like, he mastered the algorithm of short form video content so, before so, anybody so else. So you so picked so up so on so that conversation. I mean, he's just, he's, his father was a chess grandmaster. <laughs> yeah. And and I think he's just became, he just, he's, and he's very smart guy and the more hated yeah. he is the better mm -hmm. he does so when Greta Thunberg kind of tweets at him that's great for him because the more haters you he knows get, how to the more play the game he knows how mm -hmm. the algorithm thrives on conflict and and he just absolutely mastered that uh, and you saw the result so, so my question though is where did those men come from what is happening in society to manufacture that many men who felt unheard a third of men not having any sex, 80% of men on dating apps being deemed unattractive. What manufactured that? That, that we, we wouldn't, he doesn't have those search results unless there's a group of men that don't feel heard. What's making them not feel heard? Well, I think the first thing is, that it is back to the transgression point, which is yeah. that if it's really transgressive, to point out that a lot of boys and men are really struggling mm -hmm. in school and in relationships. But, but a lot of them are really right. struggling. They are really struggling, yeah. right? And so this is like, if you have a group of people who are really struggling, and pointing that out and mm. trying to do something about it is something that mainstream institutions and responsible people are not doing. And that becomes tr that becomes like a, a shocking thing to point out. I think that's part of it. And so what's happened is there's this real, a real reservoir of actual need and hurt and struggle uh, among a lot of men and, and boys. And mm. if that's not being articulated, discussed in sort of mainstream forums, then the appetite to hear about that is still there. So we create a vacuum. The failure of mainstream institutions and media organizations to be talking just straightforwardly about these issues creates a vacuum. You said when, irrespon when responsible people do not have this conversation, irresponsible people will start to have this conversation. They'll, well, mm. they'll exploit them. And they might exploit them for clicks. They might exploit them for monetary value. So like, w I think it's Andrew Tate, to that extent, is our fault. And by our fault, I mean mainstream institutions, you know, think tanks, government, what you know, universities, who aren't talking about these problems of boys and men, mm. or if they're doing it, they're doing it in a way that's kind of a semi-embarrassed. Quick, uh, could we get this over? I with tried to make thing? that point on Dr. Phil. I was saying like, right. you know, we could not have that conversation. Right. The, even the conversation we were having on Dr. Phil, right. we could not have that at a major university and without getting shouted. And, and I think I said that I am mm. actually having that conversation yeah. at universities yeah. now, which I yeah. which I am. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm doing. But I think partly I'm creating permission. I think what I'm doing, because I'm coming up with all these Permission facts, for the discussion. Permission for the discussion. Permission for the discussion. Right, it. because it's like, he's a Brookings guy. He's got chance. He seems reasonable. Mm -hmm. He sounds funny. Nobody's ever thrown anything at you. Right, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> early, uh, early days. That's where you go. Right? Yeah. But, yeah. but it's because, and what I've discovered is that actually most people do want to talk about this. They just want to talk about it in a way that doesn't require them to give up their prior commitments, say, to the service of women and girls, as long as it's not zero sum. There's a huge appetite out there for this conversation. And if we're not having it, if mm -hmm. I'm not having it, if mainstream institutions aren't having it, someone's having it. I'm glad you yeah. said that because I, I have the yeah. same discussion in the in the area of physics or science when we get into vaccines cause autism, we didn't land on the moon, or the earth is flat. When we because normal, like mm. accredited uh, PhDs don't want to have this conversation, yes. or MDs don't want to have this conversation with who they uh, 
deemed to be lunatics. Then it ends up on Joe Rogan, who has a bigger audience than all of you combined. And now the discussion, right. because it's not being happened, because it's not happening between responsible people, it's now right. happening between yeah. irresponsible people. If, if, hard, if there are hard things happening, hard questions, and you just, you just ignore them, right? And hope that they'll somehow, that no one will notice them. That doesn't happen. People mm. will notice them and they will pick them up. I'll give you an example. I was having a, an argument mm. with, I, I would describe him as a men's rights activist. I mm. don't know if he would accept the, the, mm -hmm. the guy who was, it was a private conversation. He said, well, they don't care about male suicide. I said, okay, who's they? And he said, the government, CDC. I mm. said, I'm sure they do care. Why, why do you say that? He sent me a link. The link was to the CDC page on uh, disparities in suicide. Mm. And it doesn't have a subsection on by gender. It does veterans, it does LGBTQ, it does, yeah. it does mm -hmm. it doesn't have it. And, and I'm looking at this while I'm on the phone with this guy and he's saying, you see, there isn't a section on the CDC website on disparities in suicide mm -hmm. that points out that there is a big, there's a four fold gap in suicide. And I'm literally, I'm cursing the CDC bureaucrats while I'm on the phone with this guy because I can't tell him he's crazy mm -hmm. when they haven't got that on the website. So I'm yeah. like, for the love of God, Put that on the website. Have a whole section. Have a task force on male mental health. Mm -hmm. Get the Gender Policy Council to do work on boys but, and men but, so that the next time yes. I'm on the phone with that guy, I can yeah. say, you're crazy. But, but it could is. it be because there are people in the CDC who are so politically progressive, they do not want to have that subset? Could that possibly be the reason? Yeah, I yeah. think that is. I think that's right. I think yeah. for some of them, actually, they just they they don't want I would go one step further. Or they're worried they'll be criticized by people. Well, re recently, I'm, I'm watching, in fact, I did a show or a part of a show uh, last Sunday on this. Uh, ben Shapiro was like very concerned that there's these new findings that uh, w uh, young girls are attempting suicide more these days. And I'm like, but Jesus they're not Christ, but they're not killing themselves at three and a half to five times the rate of guys. So, so, you know? just, just, but, wait, but that's what he yeah. talks about. Yeah. And he does not want to talk about the, the fact that it's been that way for so, a so very long time. Let's just talk about this real quick because a lot of people are going to be very confused by this. Yeah, we only got men, six more Men and women uh, attempt suicide at about the same rate. Men right. commit suicide at a much, much yes. higher rate Four because higher rate. They, they tend to jump off of bridges and, and put guns in their mouth. That, yes. That's why I'm just going to be honest with you. That's the difference versus sleeping pills. That's that's kind of where the difference happens. Or slitting your uh, wrist. That's, yes. that's mm -hmm. kind of where those disparities happen last question mm. i want to ask you you mm. said masculinity is more feminine than fra uh, than femininity more fragile more fragile sorry mm. Mas masculinity more fra fragile than femininity mm. throughout time can you go into describe that yeah when you talk about fragile masculinity it sounds like a slur right, right. it sounds like a bit of an eye-rolling thing that actually some people might, would say from the other side of the argument what i mean by that is the the construction of masculinity and especially mature masculinity it's just a bit more social it's a it's a more of a cultural task it doesn't come quite as naturally yeah um because we don't have quite the same sort of obvious reproductive markers right, right. as women and that's why i think societies have very often had to work quite hard to have certain rites of passage to have certain ways of learning around what it means to go from boy to man and so what I mean by the sense it's more fragile is that it is more socially constructed, that it's more of a task for a culture and for a society to figure out how we're going to help boys to become men, how we're going to teach them what it means to be a good and a mature man. Mm. I don't think it comes quite as naturally as it does for women. Now, it's not to say there aren't social constructions around femininity as well, but I think masculinity is more of a cultural task than femininity is, which is why I don't think you very often hear about a crisis right. of femininity. I, I would, right. I, I've, it's, I've written about right. exactly this too. It's, okay. it's, it's this idea, really since the, the, sec, the time of the sexual revolution, when uh, women be, start to become more independent, that's when guys start saying, well, should I be macho? Should I not be macho? Yeah, what how I, should I be? Yeah, how yeah. should I be kind yeah. of thing. We're, get, we're at a point right now, I think, you know, here we are like almost 60 years later, um, where guys of the last, certainly the last two generations, if not the last four, are not necessarily questioning their masculinity or having it questioned all the time. It's they either are their self-loathing when it comes to that. It's, it's mm. bad to be a man. Mm -hmm. We're you know, uh, you know, was it not boys will be boys. Boys will be good humans, right? Or else it's I don't know what masculinity is, so it's subjective, and I'll create it for myself rather than having some sort of concrete. We would not be having this conversation in a pre-sexual revolution. Uh, society in that like uh, the what the 50s or 40s that's why we keep hearkening back what, to those times because that's the only right. the only point we can remember it wasn't a because question. like your grandfather would not have this conversations what is a man what is a woman that would be simply like right. you know it's self-evident but now i think really as women have become more masculinized and have become more um and become more uh, independent of men what's that what that's done is it's opened up opportunities for uh sort of exploiting this uncertainty 
of generations of men is, well, what is a man? Well, a real man does X. A real man does this. And whatever X is tends to be the pet ideology of whoever has that interest in mm. convincing that guys. Toxic masculinity is this, but real men do this. Mm. So it's, and whatever this is, is usually representative of what that ideology is. Yeah, and I, what I would, uh, so I agree with the fact that there's this period of flux and uncertainty. Mm. And we're, we're asking questions about what does it mean to be a man? Uh, by the way, women too. I mean, it, like it was true. My grandmother didn't have to. Really oh yeah, they didn't have to ask that question. Right, but, but it's the yeah. same for like a lot of women now, kind of figure, figuring out mm -hmm. like I know how to be a woman. And and uh, what we've done is we've expanded the range of ways that we can be masculine and can be feminine, and the mm -hmm. roles we can play. And that is both a wonderful thing, and a very challenging thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the world's much easier when society just tells you how to be. Yeah. Right. And all you've got to do is follow orders. That's very easy. It's very hard to be in a society where, oh wait, there's a thousand ways to do this. Crikey, that's hard. Mm -hmm. And But what we shouldn't do is just abandon people to that. What we shouldn't do is say, okay, fine, good luck figuring this out. We should be helping them figure it out. And I think the key thing is mm -hmm. not to throw out the very idea of masculinity just because we're expanding it and giving it more choice. And potentially, this is a really wonderful thing that we're having here. I know I'm, mm -hmm. we focused on the crisis and there's lots of really difficult things going on. But potentially, this could be great. It could be wonderful going forward. It's like, you don't have to stop being a guy. You don't have to stop being masculine. But look at all these different things you can do now, these different ways you can be masculine. Mm -hmm. I was able to stay at home and care for my kids. That was not something that my dad had as an option. I still consider myself to be a guy. And I think I probably parented slightly differently. But what a wonderful world it is that allowed me to be that kind of guy as well as this kind of I would also, I would argue that also, I know we got, we're out of time, but right. I would also argue this. Is like we were talking about teachers a little while ago, and there's mm. a definite deficit in teachers. Uh, it's, in, it's in the UK, Canada, and the sure. United States right now. 77% of your teachers today from preschool K all the way to second yeah. will be females yes. in the United States. 70, it's higher in other countries, yes. actually. Yes. And so w because those jobs are not, well, they're, men don't see teaching as a, uh, a career path because it's they tend to be low paying mm -hmm. and there's there's very little uh, you know status involved in all of that so it's like they're not going to be selected because they're teachers mm -hmm. it's better to be a professional athlete or a rock star or whatever it is than it is to be a teacher and so those the idea of, well, we can play these different roles now as guys and we have, we've got this, you know, I can be Mr. Mom or whatever else. The problem is with those roles is that it doesn't eliminate the, uh, the biological pr uh, proclivities of men and women to think that, well, I, if I'm a teacher, it'd be great and a noble cause and it's a noble profession but I'm only gonna make $45,000 a year and sure. I'm never gonna be able to get with the hot girls that he's at at Zook, you know? Like yes. that's, that's a kind of, like that's, so that's, that's that, that, whether that's a cognitive like no, no, recognition or no, not, but not say, so, so, those, yeah. so those new roles that are opening up conflict with our old uh, evolutionary firmware, I guess. Maybe that's a better well, way Well, they don't it. have to though. I mean, you take teaching as an example, mm -hmm. and I think I'm a bit obsessed with that we need more men in our classrooms for sure. I, I think but, we do actually. But in, 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 in 1980, 40% of elementary and middle school teachers were male. Now it's 20%. Mm -hmm. so, it, so it's become a female profession. It didn't used to be. It used to be a perfectly honorable thing for guys yeah, to do. Yeah, because we right? think they're all going to be kitty and, touchers. And, and you, and, whatever and, the and, reason uh, is. And you brought up that men or that boys tend to do better in subjects they struggle at when they like have English. male teachers. Like English. Like mm -hmm. English. Yeah. And that women actually do the same. They, they do STEM. better in, in STEM yeah. when they have female teachers. I think that's a huge reason. But also the other reason to have more male teachers is they're more likely to be coaches after yeah. school and so on too. And I just think that that idea that we, have, we should have institutions generally where there are representatives of both, both sexes, right? Yeah. Um, so I, you know, we want more female members of Congress and we want more male elementary school teachers, don't we? Sure. Um, so, that, so that our boys see men teaching, uh, including things like English, and our girls mm. see women passing laws, mm. right? That's the do you future think, do we you want. Think, do you think it would be more impressive to have a woman working in like construction or raw sewage or something? I'd say long haul shoreman, yeah, long shoreman kind of thing. Would that be more impressive than say a woman who goes to Congress? Because we still have a deficit in those those jobs, like as women don't choose to become, no. you know, the, you know, the sanitation workers. Okay, no. they choose to be like, I want to get into a higher. Well, I don't blame them. Yeah. Do well, yeah, I don't either. But the yeah. thing is, is if we're going to talk about, you know, we, we need to see more men in this, and we need to see more. Well, you could women say the 
same thing about like healthcare yeah. assistants, you know, care home, like they're pretty mm-hmm. poorly paid. Those are you know, those are oh, well, yeah. almost I mean, it's, all it's, women. Well, uh, I, I, so, I think it's interesting right. that we 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 uh, we demonize, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a point here. I think it's it's interesting that we demonize like say major universities and say they're going to be these feminist indoctrination camps and everything else, but yet we still pay those teachers so low. That I'm pretty sure socialism looks like a pretty damn good deal to people who are in those in those institutions because we don't take care of those teachers. We don't right. value them enough. If you want to put more right. men into uh, teaching positions, you've got to make it more appealing. Got to incentivize it, and it will never until I, we incentivize those things. It's going to be. But just we knew be what that too. We had to incentivize. <clears throat> we had to help women get into traditionally male roles with scholarships and so on too. Mm-hmm. So we should do the same. We need a massive recruitment drive yeah. of men into our schools, especially to teach subjects like English, because if they don't see men in those institutions, they're not around men, they don't have male teachers showing them, to some extent, just just performing masculine, just showing what it means to be a guy. Mm-hmm. Back to this point about Andrew Tate, right? If you have a, a boy, say, who maybe has lost touch with his father, mm. maybe there aren't very men in, many men in his community, maybe he doesn't go to church or there aren't school, you know, groups around, then he goes to school where there are no male teachers, mm. mm-hmm. no male coaches. It's perfectly possible that he could get sort of close to adolescence and not have had any strong male role models in his life. Mm-hmm. There is nobody that thinks that's a good idea nobody and so one thing we can do about that from a policy point of view is let's at least get more men into our classroom yeah yeah, yeah. awesome Wait, let's, do, we got, we, let's do super he, chats and get, then we're going to do an out, yeah. outro do you have any more okay. super chats you want to read no, uh is there any any more pressing there travis i think i, I mean, saw they're, two they're like all 20 dollars super chats because they think they because they, they realize that yeah uh just give me the last like three i suppose there i'm looking at uh, it right yes, now yes sir we got uh, Terrell Xavier saying, RR said that women don't need to rely on men is good. Problem? That ignores the reality that population collapse is the most dangerous thing humans can do to themselves. Also, Andrew never said women were less than men. Terrell right. Xavier for $20 okay. super chat. ML with the $20 pound uh, super yeah. chat. When women are independent financially, it is shifting the hypergamy uh, criteria towards hot dudes. Consequence, 80% of men become invisible to women. The... In danger, this, in this endangers monogamy. Uh, more positive for peace in society, according to you. Hmm. Okay, and last last one is a uh, Jethro Jethro Ref, Refro. Uh, Twenty dollars super chat. The biggest reason for all this because women are not uh, growing their growing their natural biological superpower, and neither are men. Women uh, superpower is nurturing humans, and man is to is to nature the world's the world for humans to be. In full circle. There we go. Hey guys, uh, let's use Grammarly from now on and yes, let's try to yes. get these things grammatically English is correct. Your second Makes language. it a little harder for us to read these. <laughs> we need more uh, male English, English teachers. Teacher. This English is teachers. why we need okay. more male English teachers. Uh, uh, Dr. Reeves, <laughs> cannot tell you what an honor it is <laughs> to have you. I want to say thank you so we much. We got to bring coming. you back. Yeah. I could go forever. For sure. <laughs> but having you come on here, I would love to have him <laughs> on Access Vegas to be honest. Yeah, oh, that, that would be great. Uh, 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 <laughs> I get in trouble with the wife. Hey, so, boys. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so so the thing is, I just want to let you know. Obviously, you know, uh, we had an apol. I want to have an apolitical discussion where we just deal with facts. And I always want you to know, you're welcome. Uh, anybody else who's out there is welcome because a lot of times yeah. what happens is there's this belief that we can't all have these conversations or there's like some internet beef or not not with you mm. obviously not with you but there's some some people who are like well we can't have a rational discussion about this and I really do appreciate you coming and mm. having the discussion and, mm. and just wanting to let you know because uh, some people might actually have this idea that they're not welcome or the idea that we're going to become cantankerous or acrimonious mm. and it would definitely not going to happen so thank yeah. you so much for doing us the honor of coming on here. I really appreciate that. Where can we find your book? It is Of Boys and Men. Where can we find your book? Yes, you? Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why yeah. It Matters and What to Do About It. All good bookstores. I also have a sub stack, yeah. uh, which is called Of Boys and Men. So if people want to check out my work, they can do that or obviously through the Brookings or on my, on my Twitter feed. But uh, yeah, I, and I want to thank you because I think that's the point. We don't want to have spaces where we just can't engage and mm-hmm. sometimes deeply disagree with each other, yes. but, but in, a, in a productive way. That's the point. Oh. Well, we, you cannot test the strength of an idea unless you have open debate. Correct. So. Beautiful. Can't wait to have him debate Andrew Tate. The crucible right, of open it. debate. Well, I'm here for that <laughs> one. You're here for that one. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Awesome. We'll, we'll set that up for you. All, all right. right. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you all for watching, man. Over a thousand people in yeah. the, uh, watching Very us good. today. I really, really appreciate it. He's got to run to another appointment, but this has been absolutely fantastic. Having yes. more academic, uh, having more academics on here is something that we really look forward to. We really, really want uh, mm-hmm. to do because, listen, man, I, I love, I, I, I don't like this idea. I've, I only believe things because the Republicans say it or because the Democrats say it. We believe in things because they're empirical true and because we can prove them Suss out because the strength of the idea the strength of the idea i have had my mind changed several times by dr bus and other ac- uh, academics so i just want to say thank you you've actually changed my mind on a few things so i appreciate that guys we will okay. see you all next week bye guys <laughs>